Okay, we'd like to begin the meeting of the Planning Commission this morning. If I can ask you all please to stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. If I can have the clerk call the roll, please. Commissioner McGee? Here. Commissioner Dukas? Here. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Commissioner Onstott? Here. Commissioner Wessner? Present. Item four is public comments. This is a time set aside on the, on the agenda for comments by citizens on matters that are not appearing on the agenda today. And uh, I think I have one speaker card. Mary Cummings, Cummins, excuse me. One for public, for, for general comment. And yes. I believe the other one is for Item eight. comments on the topic number eight. Yes. Okay, so you're speaking on general comments? Yes. Okay. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Mary Cummins. I've been a real estate expert, broker, appraiser in Southern California for over 30 years. And in March of 2004, I filed a complaint against the property at 10995 Peer View. Um, I, that property is controlled by Carlos Sitterman and the Deer Creek Ranch LLC. Um, the complaint was for operating a business in a residential zone without a conditional use permit. They admit they've been doing this since 2005. They breed, board, and sell horses, goats, and ducks. They also allow their clients to ride their horses on the trails behind their house. Uh, number two, um, Carlos Sitterman, he bulldozed a protected creek. He leveled the land. He removed brush and oak trees without a permit. Uh, he dug a 15-foot wide flat trench in the creek to make his own personal horse trail going into the state parkland. Uh, he's riding his horses off trail and over the neighboring property. And number three, you probably know this, um, all along Deer Creek Road, there are many illegal unpermitted signs in the coastal zone in a scenic area. Some of these signs are 8 foot by 12 foot plywood signs right on the side of the road attached to gates or stand alone. I mean, they're hideous harassing signs. Now, um, I believe Carlos Sitterman, he has a personal agenda and a history, which is why he opposed the CUP at 11077 Pier View. He's been trying to buy this property for many years, and he's not been allowed to, so now he's trying to run his neighbors off the property by defaming them and harassing them and doing everything he can to not have their conditional use permit approved. Now, um, Carlos and his company, Property ID, have been sued by the Department of Justice, the Housing Urban Development Department, for giving illegal kickbacks. Um, he was found guilty of this and was also sued by his clients and businesses. He was forced to settle for over $7.5 million. He had to disgorge all of his ill-gotten gains. Um, he also, um, it came to light in a lawsuit, after all these things were found out, that um, he lied when he said he started PID in 1976. His ex-wife stated in sworn testimony he started in 1994. He actually started in 1995. He had his website. Still says he started in 1976, 20 years earlier. His son, Carlos, in sworn statement also said that Carlos forged a law degree and put it on his office wall, and he tells everyone that he is a, a real estate attorney, and he hasn't even graduated from college. He never went to law school. Um, I'm telling you this just so you know that he has a history of lying and he has a personal agenda, so you should consider this when you regard his testimony in his objections to the conditional use permits for 11077 Peer View. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another speaker? <coughs> Steve Hoffman. Good morning, Good Chair morning. Rodriguez, Honorable Commissioners. My name is Andrew Guilford. I represent Carlos Siderman. Um, I'm here to speak on agenda item number eight, but also want to respond in general comments to the assertions made by Ms. Cummins. Um, the assertions made by Ms. Cummins are false, um, but more fundamentally, none of that is properly before the commission today. Uh, it has nothing to do with the issues that are before the commission today. Uh, we make only clear that Mr. Seidemann firmly rejects what Ms. Cummins is asserting. Thank you. Thank you. I have Steve Offerman. Good 
Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Steve Offerman from the Office of Ventura County Supervisor Steve Bennett. Supervisor Bennett has been made very well aware of the situation that affects residential beachfront homeowners throughout the coastal zone with regard to decks constructed within side yard setbacks. He's aware that there are many such decks, many of which were lawfully permitted at the time of their construction, and currently the coastal zoning ordinance doesn't even allow property owners to apply for a coastal permit to keep uh, those decks, and it causes additional permitting complications on the property generally with those sort of nonconformities or illegalities. So Supervisor Bennett supports the processing of a coastal zoning ordinance amendment to address the issue of side yard decks in coastal residential zones. This is an issue of great concern to many homeowners and the existence of many of these non-conforming decks throughout the county has led to many adverse situations in coastal communities. Uh, I should say the existence of these decks has not, uh, well, for the, for the owner of the deck, it's led to some adverse uh, permitting and regulatory situations. But in terms of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conflict, in terms of resource impacts, in terms of compromising of the uh, general public's utilization of the coastal zone, we are not aware of any such impacts caused by having a deck in a side yard setback. So our office, including uh, former Coastal Commissioner Brian Brennan, will be having discussions with the Coastal Commission staff regarding this issue. And depending on the outcome of this uh, discussion with the Coastal Commission, Supervisor Bennett will be pursuing a one or another course of action to bring the issue of amending the Coastal Zoning Ordinance before the Board of Supervisors. Uh, as we all know, it's a lengthy and complicated process. We don't expect it to either come before the board shortly or uh, be resolved uh, shortly either. And of course, it will have to go through the full public review, environmental review, policy review, and coastal commission review process. It may uh, trigger issues that we're well aware of, and, and of course, Supervisor Bennett reserves his final judgment on the merits of approving such an ordinance amendment until all of those appropriate reviews have occurred. But I'm here today that we to say uh, before the Commission and the public that we support the processing of an amendment to allow decks to be constructed in coastal residential side yard setbacks and we'll be taking actions to move that zoning ordinance amendment forward in the near future. Thank you. Question? Just on my, on my own, for my own clarification. So your comments in, in, on behalf of Commissioner Bennett are his comments not in, and not as the board Correct. comment. Correct. Well, they're the your comments aren't representing the board; they're representing Commissioner Bennett or Supervisor, Supervisor Bennett, Bennett uh, as a lone county supervisor. Yes, right. and and they're under public comment, speaking generally and, and uh, not directly related, although tangentially related, I suppose, to other agenda items. Just, uh, this Thank is a legislative you. matter. Mr. Chair, if I may, item six, we have the minutes for approval. Oh, we do have items. I stand corrected. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, regressing uh, back to item five, approval of minutes, uh, March 20th, 2014. Second. Oh, that's right. We gotta get your magic mouse out. On the floor, on the floor. I think I'm going to hit the wrong button. <laughs> okay, moving, uh, continuing. Uh, item six, approval of the April 3rd, uh, 2014 minutes. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Motion passes. Item eight. Um, Excuse me, item seven. Um, LU 12 0018, applicant uh, Nancy Caldwell on behalf of Lori Kelly. Um, the appellant, uh, 
Brian Cranston. Staff. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez, members of the Commission. I'm Michelle Glukert Deanna of Planning Division Staff, here to present Appeal Case LU 120018. Perfect. The project site is located in the north coast within the community of Muscle Shoals, right off Highway 101, just north of Ventura and south of La Conchita. The site address that we are, the site address for the project that we're reviewing today is 6766 Breakers Way. This photo shows what exists on the ground today as viewed from the front of the property along Breakers Way. It shows Cranston's raised walkway, which functions as a deck. And I'd like to point out that the railing is attached to the edge of the concrete and not attached to the top of the deck. Here's another photo that shows what exists on the ground today, and this is as viewed from the back of the property, looking down onto the deck that is currently installed on the Cranston property. So the applicant is requesting a minor, minor modification to Coastal PD Permit 1016 to construct a concrete cap to be cantilevered between six concrete wing supports. The concrete cap is proposed a half inch from the northern property line and entirely on the Kelly property. The project also includes 13 linear feet of new six foot tall fencing and a door to be installed on the eastern edge or the front of the property. The appellant is requesting that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution of intent to amend the Coastal Zoning Ordinance and also an opportunity to modify the site plan to allow the railing of the existing Cranston deck to remain in place over the property line. After the um, Planning Commission hearing of February 20th, the appellant submitted a modified site plan and this is included in your packet as Exhibit C. This shows the new request to leave the posts of the railing as installed but not as approved and extending three inches over the property line. This is the set of plans that was approved by the planning division for the Cranston property in 2010. As we discussed briefly at the hearing of February 20th, the planning division first approved a coastal plan development permit for the Cranston dwelling in October 2008. In 2010, Larry Graves submitted a permit adjustment for the Cranston dwelling, and the permit adjustment was to reduce the overall square footage of the dwelling, to reduce the garage to 200 square feet and add a car lift to accommodate the required two parking spaces for a single family dwelling, and also to add a spa in the rear yard. Although the raised concrete walk, which is the subject of the hearing today, was not included specifically as part of the project description in that permit adjustment, um, this section view that you see was included and it was stamped as part of the approved set of plans. So that is how the raised walkway or the deck came to be on the Cranston property. This is the project that is before your commission. This is the set of plans that we presented to you on February 20th. This is the request from the applicant from the Kellys to construct a one foot nine inch concrete cap just within the property line of the Kelly property at 6766 Breakers Way. And I just wanted to point out to your commission that on this set of plans, the railing on the Cranston deck is shown as it was approved in 2010 by the planning division to be on top of the concrete deck and completely within the Cranston property. This is the modified site plan that was submitted on February 25th. It's dated February 24th, and this was submitted after the February 20th hearing that we had before your commission. The appellant, Cranston, is submitting this modified site plan to request that he be allowed to leave the railing as installed but not as approved at the edge of the concrete deck extending three inches over the property line onto the Kelly property. And this is a photo sim that our GIS department prepared just to visually represent what is being requested here. It shows the existing deck on the Cranston proper property. 
as well as what the proposed one foot nine inch concrete cap would look like if installed according to the plans that were submitted and the subject of the hearing. So as we discussed at the February 20th hearing, the appellant's request is twofold. First, the appellant requests to modify the site plan to allow the existing railing of the existing Cranston deck to remain in place as installed. And that is shown in the set of plans dated February 24th that are included in your packet as Exhibit C. Oops. And second, the appellant requests that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution of intent to amend the Coastal Zoning Ordinance to remove the prohibition of decks in the side yard setback pursuant to Ventura County Coastal Zoning Ordinance 8184-2.1b. As we stated in the, in the staff report and also discussed at the last hearing, the Planning Division currently does not have such an amendment on the list of current and upcoming long-range projects. We have not received direction or funding from the Board of Supervisors to process such an amendment, and we have not received a privately initiated application for such an amendment. A revision of the Coastal Zoning Ordinance is not the project that is before your commission today. The proposed project is to construct a concrete cap with wing supports. And still, since the February 20th hearing, I just wanted to let you know that um, Planning Division staff has received 28 letters in support of the appellant's request, and those have been included in your packet as exhibits E, I, and J. Planning staff received a letter from Ken High dated February 25th, 2014 and we have a few responses to the points that were raised in that letter. The first point uh, clarifies the appellant's request for a zone text amendment, and staff responds that it is inappropriate for the commission to consider a zone text amendment because that is not the subject of the hearing today. And to date, none of the actions that are required to initiate a proposal to amend the ordinance have occurred. Another point raised in the letter was the appellant's request to the Planning Commission to initiate a zone text amendment as part of the hearing on the application for the minor modification. And again, staff contends that it is inappropriate for the Commission to consider a zone text amendment because that's not the project that's before you today. The appellant has also stated that he is not willing to pay the cost of a zone text amendment. And staff's response to this is that either the appellant or another private entity must pay for a private, privately initiated zone text amendment or the Board of Supervisors must authorize funding for and direct planning the planning division to process a county initiated zone text amendment. The appellant submitted a modified site plan showing the railing as installed but not as approved. And staff's response to this modified site plan is that the appellant did not build the railing according to the approved plans in 2010 and in fact illegally installed the railing three inches over the property line. And this modified site plan does not comply with the Coastal Zoning Ordinance setback requirements. So in summary, the information that was contained in the February 25th letter from Ken High does not change staff's analysis of the project. It does not change staff's recommendation to your commission. The project before your commission is the request to construct a one foot nine inch concrete cap with wing supports. The project is not the modified site plan, nor is it a zone text amendment. So for the reasons set forth in the administrative record and as we discussed in more detail at the February 20th hearing, planning staff has determined that three of the five required CUP findings cannot be made for this project and they're listed on your screen. I went through this in detail at the February 20th hearing. Um, I'm not planning on doing that again today, but I certainly can if there are any questions or if you'd like me to repeat any of our responses to um, why each of these findings we feel cannot be made. And the hearing of February 20th was properly noticed. At that hearing, your commission continued the hearing to a date time certain to April 17th. So no additional legal or mailed notice was sent. 
uh, planning staff emailed interested parties on April 10th to make them aware that the memo to your commission along with all the exhibits were available on the planning division website and all of that was posted on April 10th. The recommended actions to your commission which have not changed since February 20th include that your commission certify your review and consideration of this item, that you find the project to be exempt from CEQA, that you deny appeal LU 120018, deny minor modification to coastal PD permit PD 1016, and specify that the clerk of the Planning Commission be the custodian of the record. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions now or later. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Just. You're right. <laughs> Disclosures. No disclosures. Commissioner Dukas. I visited the site and walked um, the, the length of Muscle Shoals, um, looked at at least 20 properties, many of which appeared to me to have um, side decks. I have no disclosures. No disclosures. No disclosures. <coughs> Questions of staff, Commissioner Megan. Yeah, um, <clears throat> had those posts on that fence, instead of being attached to the side of that deck, been attached to the top of the deck on the edge, would that, that would have been legal? Yes, that is what the planning division approved, uh, albeit errone erroneously we approved in 2010. And I can pull up the site plan that was approved again if that would be helpful. Well, no, I just want to know that that would yes. be legal then. If it, they, if where they're at now, if they were unbolted, set on top of the uh, uh, board or on top see of that the rock deck. there, and then reattached, that would be legal. Yes. Okay. Then uh, <clears throat> I read somewhere where uh, this idea of hanging these things in suspension somehow, as long as they were on no, not over the edge of that walkway, that would be legal. It seems odd, but would that be legal? I'm not sure I'm following you. Hanging in, in suspension, they would still be considered a structure for our purposes. Um, hanging in suspension from, from the well, deck on the property or from something else? What the letter said that there's no reason why that wouldn't be legal. I'm just trying to find out what that is. Maybe I need to get that from the uh, appellant. Okay, thank you. Okay. Commissioner Dukas. So um, <clears throat> it appears to me that um, side decks were approved previously, but they're not being approved now? I can only speak on the project that is before you today and for the Cranston project because I was the case planner for that case. And the side deck should not have been approved, but it was approved for that because the deck is considered to be a structure and it's within the three-foot side setback on that property, and so therefore it does not comply with the ordinance. But <clears throat> if you got it approved before and it was constructed, can the county come back and say, oops, that wasn't right? You can't, you can't rely on, on the approval that we, that we gave you, and you have to go through trouble and expense to, to change it? For that particular case, that's not what we're asking. We're admitting that we erroneously approved that set of plans. We're not requiring him to remove that deck as we approved it. However, we are requiring that it be installed as approved. So even though the approval was by mistake, the as long as it is constructed according to the approved plans, we will not take any enforcement action on it. However, the issue that I was trying to illustrate in my presentation is that it was not constructed as approved. I saw on the other side of the property on this house, that's where uh, there's another side deck or walkway. And uh, the, the railing structure is uh, in the concrete rather than attached to the side. It's, it's actually on top of um, and, and that's how uh, planning is saying that that should uh, be in, installed now? Yes. 
Commissioner okay. Dukas, I, I want to clarify something right here. The, the, the issue is, in this case, is that those three inches are not on his property, and so that's not how it was approved. The other person's deck next door is built entirely on his property. Mr. Cranston's deck, had he put the railing on top, would have been entirely on his property. He didn't put the railing on top. He put the railing on the side. Therefore, he built on somebody else's property, right? And, and I just want to be... I just want to have the discussion about, you know, inches matter in planning, right? They're there for a reason. So you say you need to build up to your property line, and that's, that's what you get. And I, I also want to talk about just the way that this deck happened, because I know Michelle is, is uh, you know, taking the brunt of this. But, you know, it was applied for in 2008 without a deck. You come in for a permit adjustment, and in the permit adjustment, you ask for uh, the, redu the reduction of the garage, the reduction in the square foot, a car lift, and a spa. And then on the plan, you just throw in a deck, right? So when you're looking at a permit adjustment, you're looking for what the applicant is asking you for. I want these four things. You don't expect a deck to show up on, you know, sheet eight of a plan. So she didn't catch it. I don't, I don't really consider that being her fault. I consider that really, if they wanted that deck, in the setback, they should have asked for it in the permit adjustment, and we would have properly reviewed it at that time and said no. So that, that's how that deck came to be there, and then it's just exacerbating the problem by then putting the railing on your neighbor's property. I, I understood. Um, however, it was my observation that there are a lot of these decks in that neighborhood. That, that neighborhood is a very old neighborhood that has been built over a hundred year period of time, right? And that is the story of the coast. It is a very eclectic neighborhood. So some of them, those decks were put in before the code existed and before the requirement existed. Some of them were put in legally and perhaps some of them were put in illegally, but we haven't done the research, nor would we on that, you know, given the case that's in front of us. The very narrow issue of the case in front of us is, is what he's asking in compliance with today's law? You want to build one foot, nine inches on your neighbor's property. It's not a cap. It's not anything other than an extension of the deck. Is that legal under today's code? That's the issue that's in front of your planning commission today. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Wilson. I understand what staff's coming from, and, and I support it, by the way. But I have an interesting situation for Mr. Kelly and his property in saying that he's under court order to allow intrusion into his property. I, I, I know you're going that way. So that's kind of where I'm in a little bit of a loop. Part of it is so the county doesn't expose itself for doing a taking. I, I get that. But at the same time, we have evidence that um, the adjacent landowner is required to allow the use of the property. Legal use. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not phrase that in a question. Smack me around the next time I do that. All right. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the applicant, who is legally bound, provided the application for Mr. Cranston and they cannot object to Mr. Cranston being into their space. But now the county is going to hold hard on that three inches simply because that's the requirement of the ordinance. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I don't believe the easement gives him any right to break the law, right? So the easement just says use and enjoyment of the property. You can put a strip of grass out there and, and a lawn chair and enjoy the property, right? It doesn't mean that you can do something that the county ordinance doesn't allow. So, yes, so he signed the application, and, and, and Mr. Kelly has all along said, hey, if it's legal, I'm all for it. If it's not legal, I'm not for it. So we're saying it, it doesn't comply with today's code. And... And that's what he's asking under today's code. Can he have it? Is this Thank encroachment you. even at issue today? The in the the three inch encroachment from the railing is that right. even at issue? I it, thought it was a construction of this new uh, improvement. Is it not? Yeah. Yeah, it's an issue because that was not a, what was approved according to the approved plans that both planning division and the building and safety division reviewed. And then when the building and safety division did their inspection and found out that they did not build in accordance with the approved plans. They rescinded the final inspection and approval of the deck and said, hey, this is in violation, but we're not going to require you at this point in time to remove 
the railing until they saw the outcome of this commission hearing and whether or not you would possibly allow it. And at that point, they would have to resubmit plans such as what they did in the modified site plan. That would be sent back to building a safety. They would review it to make sure it complies with the building code. And then presumably they could approve it if it uh, complied with the building code. But I didn't understand that to be an issue in this proceeding. You're saying it's sort of tangential and got drug along? Yeah, I mean it's it's a violation. It's well, a violation. I that, yeah, there's, so there's no enforcement proceeding except for what building and uh, safety is done. Yeah, but the the violation issue is not an issue for this Thanks. appeal of this hearing right now. Commissioner Dukes, let's speculate that um, at some time in the future we'll have a, a text amendment to the coastal zoning ordinance allowing decks inside yards. How would that um, affect this uh, situation if that were to um, come to fruition? And they found that in some cases you can have side decks in the coastal zone. Would that um, change anything? Uh, would, would he still, would the, uh, the railing going over the property line, would that still not be allowed? It really depends on what exact, exactly approved as part of his own text amendment. Um, what Mr. Hyas suggested to be allowed and actually Supervisor Bennett's office has presented to us, um, it looks like it would allow what um, the appellant is requesting to be approved today. Um, but once again, we, we can't really say because we don't know exactly what would be adopted because there's pretty <laughs> arduous procedure you have to go through to amend the coastal zoning ordinance. We don't know what would be the outcome after going through that whole process because there's a number of considerations that go into a zone text amendment. Um, we have that prepared. The planning director actually See, has a list. The thing so that just, we don't really know. But, but just get back to you, um, speculatively um, or theoretically, I, I should say. Um, let's assume that the zone text amendment was approved and it did allow what the appellant is requesting. At that point, the appellant can go ahead, file the minor modification to um, obtain approval of what he actually wants, and then we would process it and, yeah, it would be approved because there wouldn't be anything with which it would be in violation. Well, so. the, the thing that can, is such a conundrum is that uh, the, what is desired is going to be constructed on the neighbor's property because they have a private... Um, agreement with the adjacent property owner that that they can you know they have an easement but how does the county get involved with something like that i've i remember other cases where the county can't get involved in these private easement issues so what what is the county's role in that yeah i mean as we stated in the staff report and i believe it's exhibit a which stated what uses and development are allowed on within that easement we don't enforce easements, we just enforce the code. Um, so we cannot deny the development based upon the fact that it either complies or doesn't comply with the terms of the easement. All we can do is take action based upon what the code authorizes us to do. So if it complies with the law, setback requirements, height requirements, everything that applies, then we can't deny it. But it would, if there was a disagreement between the two property owners, that would be a civil matter which they could battle out in court which the attorneys all know very well. But, but see, I, I'm still not understanding because we, you have a, a property line and the coastal zoning ordinance, I assume, you know, takes everything into account that you have, you know, you have a lot and you have setbacks from those lines, mm -hmm. not from a, so I don't see how a, a, a text amendment would change this, uh, the, you know, what we would do here. That's the thing that I'm, t I'm just not understanding, that even if we had uh, the ability to, uh, you know, after this, this hearing, if, if it's something that the Planning Commission wishes to introduce, and the Planning Commission, you know, says, you know, we think uh, it might be a good idea to, to see about these side side decks in the coastal zone, I don't see how that changes this case because you still have a property line. I, help me. Uh, Commissioner Dukas, if I yes. may, um, 
I think your, your, your comment raised a couple issues. Um, the, the first issue is, is when any project uh, implicates more than one property, uh, the, the planning division requires the owner, in this case of the adjacent property, to sign off on the permit application. And so that, that addresses a project going onto the other property. The, the, the planning commission or the planning division has to know that the other property owner is okay with that. And so in this case, there's an easement that allows that to happen. And, and my understanding is the adjacent property owner is legally required to, to co-sign, if you will, the permit application. And so, that, and so that's, as we've all been saying, that's not, as long as that uh, adjacent property owner signs off on the permit, and that, that, that's a, a private civil matter, then the planning division goes ahead and analyzes the project and, and permits it if possible. And, and then the second issue you're raising, uh, I think, and, and this is probably more for planning, but, but my understanding is um, your question is, well, this proposed project is going over onto the other property and, and that's um, maybe not contemplated by even by this proposed um, text amendment. Um, my understanding of that analysis would be um, the, the project would be going into the setback area uh, of the, the next um, property over. And so as long as that w was allowed under the this, this same text amendment, then, then my understanding is it would be allowable and, and we, we could permit it. And then, and then speculating even more, when you make an improvement to your property, who, who um, and that improvement is on, on someone else's property, who gets stuck with the increased tax bill? I mean, when I've, when I've made uh, improvements to, to my property, my property taxes go up. Uh, who's responsible for that? Is it the person who owns the improvement? Is it the person whose property the improvement is on? I'm assuming it would be the person owning the improvement. And w when you take that property and the title of that property in, in conjunction with the easement, then it, it really is all their property. They, they do have a legal right to push it out, and, and you look at the value of their, of their house. <coughs> so, um, okay. And same thing with insurance and liability and everything else. Would It would go with the person who is responsible for the improvement, not um, the property underneath the improvement. Correct. That's my understanding. And, and right, those would be, that's my understanding. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. One more question. Um, I read it in, in the exhibits or the staff report. Uh, I recall the, the statement that, uh, and the issue of conflict here is, is regardless of, of, of what, the, what the applicant's desire is, um, uh, as, and the issues are as relates to the, uh, uh, the easement entitlement, um, state laws and local, local codes trump any, any civil issue as it relates to, the, as it relates to this particular issue. Is that correct? It, it, that's correct. And, and, um, there's kind of two layers of law going on. The, the first layer is, is the civil layer between the two property owners. And, and so that's what the easement addresses. And so that first layer gives Mr. Cranston the right, again, to push out his improvements onto the adjacent property. And so that's the first layer. And so that's what planning needs to see before they process a permit application. But then the second layer, which is before your commission, is whether those proposed improvements are allowable under the, the county's development rules. And so just because someone has an easement, that doesn't give them any right to um, do something that's not allowed by the county's development rules. It just gives them the right to, to ask for something by using someone else's property. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Onstock. Planning Director, we're told that that this issue may affect literally hundreds of homes. Is that correct? 
Not this particular issue. No, not right? this issue, but the broader issue of the, the setbacks and the construction within the side yard. So setbacks. the broader issue, if if um, if your board chose at some time to direct us uh, to direct us to take a look at it, or we got some direction, as I heard this morning, um, if we got direction from the board to take a look at it, you know, we would then yeah count up the houses. It, it would affect the RB and the RBH zone. We would see what was out there. There's going to be a vast difference of looking at things that are you know on slab on grade versus looking at things perhaps in Muscle Shoals. We would have to you know, look at the purpose and intent of setbacks. We'd have to look at flood hazards. We'd have to talk to the fire department. You know, there's a whole myriad of things that we would look at that may affect a few hundred homes, you know, for a very specific constituency of the county, right? And that is typically what we get some direction from the board uh, that they would like us to do. So I heard this morning, same as you, that we might be getting that direction. Well, what would be the impact of granting the application? in terms of setting precedents or creating issues for the planning department? I, I think that would be it. We would be setting precedents on the planning department saying it's perfectly okay to develop your deck on your neighbor's property and develop your deck in, a, in, in, the, in the setback in violation of the code. And why would we signal that to the community that's saying it's okay to develop not according to the, to the laws that the board has already set in front of us, right? So to, to me, you know, there is an analogy is sometimes I would like to drive 70 miles an hour, but I can't drive 70 miles an hour. There's a process to change that, and I would have to go through the process to change it. I can't just break the law and then go back and, and you know, ask for forgiveness later. This, is, this is, is something that would have to be looked at holistically, and I would say in my entire time that I've been here, this issue has been raised twice. So I'm not sure why it's the big issue today, but it's been raised twice. This one on the Cranston property, which I understand he wants one foot nine inches to put some plants on at the end of it. That's what this plan is about. And then another, another issue where somebody illegally expanded their deck that we addressed too recently. So maybe these two issues combined has, has raised the, the, the issue lately. But in my vast list of, you know, 50 or 60 things that I'm already looking at in the planning department to change, this hasn't risen to that level yet, but perhaps it would if, you know, it's either privately initiated and we would take this holistic look at it, or the board directs us to, or your planning commission through a resolution of intention set at a separate date where we could talk about it and you could, you know, ask us some more details and we would bring you some preliminary information saying if you wanted to, to raise the issue to the board. But as I heard Mr. Offerman say this morning, it looks like they're already going to raise it. Now, if, some, if this commission made that recommendation, uh, would staff oppose it? I, I wouldn't. And who would pay for it? We would we would pay for it, right? So no, I wouldn't oppose anything that you asked me to do, right? <laughs> so uh, or your staff, and and I would I would you know march to those orders. But what we would do is you know at a separate hearing we would have a little bit more discussion. You would tell me what you wanted me to do. I would bring back some preliminary information, and then uh, you would tell me whether you wanted me to go to, to the board to do that. But I expect in the time that we would be able to do that, right? It would be several months before we could come back before you that maybe the board would have already come back at that time and, and directed us. So, you know, that that's what we would do through a resolution of intention set at a separate hearing. We would hear your concerns. We would talk to you about the process and what it would take, the budget of what it would take. This case already, right? So we're here on an appeal. There is no appeals charge in the coastal zone. So the county planning department has already spent $8,000 to process this appeal to get it in front of you on this specific issue. Now how would that come back to the board? Would that be on their own initiative or would that be a private application? So it can come back in several ways, right? The board, as Mr. Offerman said this morning, could take it on themselves and he could get three votes and direct us. And, and, and if the board directed us to do that, we would typically come back to them with a scope of work and a budget on what it would cost and how long it would take us to do it. And then they would decide whether they wanted to, to um, do that task. And at that time, we would go through the exercise of, of saying, Here's, here's the scope of the problem as we know it, right? And we would, we would give them that information. A privately initiated um, text amendment is always allowed. Mr. High knows that. He's met with Winston at the counter, right? So there's a fee clearly associated with that. If the community wants to take it on, that constituency, just that beach constituency that really would be affected by it instead of the entire county, right? They could take that um, on and ask for that. And at that time, we do what's called a pre-screening at the board, and it goes to the board. We say um, there's a privately initiated zone 
text amendment and it's found to be in good planning practice and consistent with the general plan. Those are the two findings that we make and would you like us to continue to process this? And that pre-screening really saves the applicant money in case that's not the board's desire. We're not spending a lot of money and coming back and they didn't want that anyway. So that's the pre-screening, the resolution of intention. We would give you some preliminary information. You would decide whether you think that's an important issue that you think that the board should take on and then we would, we would do the same thing. We would come to the board and we would say the planning commission heard this item. They think it's important that we take it on. Would you like us to take it on? And if so, we'll go back and prepare the scope of work. So regardless, at the end of anything, the board decides whether they want us to, to take it on and then they decide what budget that they're going to, you know, grant us to, to do that work. And, and if, I may, if I may, um, what happens to this? Do we... Uh, put it on hold until such time or you know what happens here I wouldn't recommend putting it on hold because it's an issue that's in front of you I mean if everybody came in with it with uh, something that they wanted and then said but just put it on hold while I process a text amendment or while the county gets to process a text amendment I mean it could be a very long time this this is a, a, a simple case to me about is, is what is what they're asking for in compliance with today's law. This issue of, and if it's not, I'll change the code, right? That's an issue for another day. I think that the issue is properly before you today and you should make a decision on it. Let me ask you this. Uh, if we denied this, we still have the little three inch issue. Now, can, in, in light of what Steve Offerman said about what Steve Bennett said, uh, can we just kind of let that sit there for a while to see what happens? Or is that he's sure. going to have to change that fence situation? No, you could make that decision to let that sit there for a while where we would stay in the enforcement action for a period of time on that, on that particular issue. I have a question. Hypothetically, if, if the commission opts to support rec recommended staff action on, on, on this item, that doesn't preclude us from uh, preclude us in a separate action asking planning to uh, give us additional information on this request does it if that's it correct you could, you could in a separate item on the agenda when we come to that you could direct me to to come back with some separate information you could direct me to to set it for a a separate hearing where you'll hear the the resolution of intention and to bring back some separate information it doesn't preclude it at all. It's just this, the, there are two separate items in my mind. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Wiesel. I hope I phrase this as a question, so I apologize to you up front. I expect Mr. High to comment on Mr. Offerman's statement. Uh, so my real question, sorry, Jeff, is we have received testimony in a public hearing under the Brown Act. That's all we can do. But in this particular situation, it has a certain gravitas affecting the decision. So the question before me is the public was not noticed that this would be here. So in the Brown process, can I use that as any weight in making my determination? Sound like a law school examination? I, I'm not... I, I'm the short answer is yes, but I guess I would need, my take is that the only way it would affect your decision is is in helping you decide whether or not to, to grant a, a partial continuance, if you will, or or ha have planning hold off on, on code enforcement. And so that's what's before you. Right. And so it, it's it's fine for you to take into account the possibility of a tax amendment and, and Mr. Offerman's statement provides an increased likelihood that that may happen, you know, again, there's no telling how long that process w would take, but that, that's fine for you to consider that possibility. Okay. Then uh, just let me enter this into the record, if you will. On page two of the staff's response, it states, it is inappropriate for the commission to consider it such a zone text amendment since a zone text amendment is not the subject of the commission's hearing. Okay, so that's where I'm in a conundrum now that I've heard from a county supervisor. Uh, so, I, I think the point of that statement was that um, the 
your your planning commission isn't considering any actual text amendment or, or taking any action in that regard, mm -hmm. and so that that specific issue isn't before you. But of course, it, it, it it's tangentially related to this, right. and so I think that's the distinction. Okay. Well, I'll be interested to hear Mr. High's response to all of this. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Chair. No further questions, staff. Thank you, Mr. High. Good morning, members of the commission. Um, I'm Count High. I represent Brian Cranston. As I mentioned before, I happen to be the president of the Breakers Way Homeowners Association, too, which is all the beachfront houses north of the pier up there in Mosul Shoals. But let me, let me just start by saying what happened since the last hearing. Um, I wanted to make sure that the people up there knew what was happening. So I sent a notice through the HOAs, the Sea Cliff, Free of Salomar, Muscle Shoals, to three, about 300 people. Uh, that's about how many houses are up there. Um, <laughs> I think I made a career error of all time when I left an N out of Dana's name in the, in the email address and didn't realize it until Monday. Um, so I then was able to send uh, through Faria's HOA and Muscle Shoals yesterday, Faria on the day before, Solomar, I don't think ever I, anybody got the re correct email address, and, and yet 28 people did respond and said that they were they were in favor of doing away with this problem. Um, in the course of that, I happened to bike around a, a lot up there as well and talk to a lot of people, um, and and even handed the notice to a, at least a dozen. To my um, I mean, fully understood everything. They fully were in support of, of d at least providing a pathway for the legalization of existing decks and a pathway for the a, a approval of future decks for new houses is over the next 30 years that are rebuilt. Um, amazingly enough, about two-thirds said, I don't want to get involved because I don't want enforcement acts against me. And, and I was going to take pictures to respond to a comment you made about I don't know how many there really are. I was going to provide photographs of all of them. Then I realized I was going to get hung by the neck until dead if I did that because people weren't going to appreciate that me copying, photographing their house. So I didn't do that. I did the Google Earth photograph. And it's not clear, of course, which ones have decks all the way to the side yard, but it's pretty obvious that there's a majority have decks, to the, especially at Faria, to, uh, that go lot line to lot line on the, on the, in the back. Um, they have jacuzzis that are there, that, you know, they have all kinds of uses of that area and, and, and they were put without the need for building permits by and large because a building permit is only required if it's 30 inches high or more. So people built them, didn't need a building permit, never thought to come and see planning about a site plan amendment. Who would think of such a thing? Um, so that's how it happened. So. Um, in the meantime, of course, I did photograph those ones at Muscle Shoals, and then planning asked me for the f names and addresses, and, and then everybody really freaked about it, getting a hit list, giving it to the county. So <clears throat> we didn't do that. Um, on the bigger issue, I mean, this, this application brought up the bigger issue of, of, of changing the code so that all those people that either that have existing decks and they might have built without a permit don't have to disclose an illegality on a refi or a sale, can remodel with a, and get a zone clearance, because right now they can't. If they ask for a zone, a zone clearance for a remodel because they don't understand the problem, they get an inspection, county goes out, what do they do? They follow a notice of noncompliance. That happened to me on my building when my, I built a bedroom. All of a sudden there's an inspection and then there's a recorded notice of noncompliance and then we're on a war. Um, <coughs> so. You know, the city of Ventura had the similar issues with illegalities in their city that were done over time. What do they do? They had an amnesty program. They allowed people to legalize what they had. And there they didn't want to continue doing it. But here it makes no sense. It never made any sense to, illeg to make decks in the side yard set back illegal. <clears throat> so on the process, the bigger question, staff report says in effect, three ways to get an amendment. A private application, which Brian Cranston won't fund, because he believes if he pays the 7,000 filing fee, he could have another $25,000 bill 
when he, by writing a blank check to the county for all this time they said they're going to spend. Two, the Board of Supervisors can, can direct it, but we don't know how to get there. Three, you can ask for, you can set this for a public hearing today at, to hold the public hearing, to agendize the issue of whether to make a recommendation of the board to change the code. That's what we want you to do today. That's what I ask you to do in the letter I wrote to you after the last hearing. You know, because it, it's, this is really common sense. Um, that's what the, 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 the process allows for. But there's no means to get it here other than this application that we could think of. So then staff report says, we didn't make the request. You can't consider it today. That is agendizing the, the question. I don't know what I did if I didn't write that in the last letter and make that request at the last hearing, but then I wrote a second letter on Monday and specifically quoted the staff report and said, I hereby make that request to agendize the issue of, of, a, of, of, of a resolution of intention to make a recommendation to change the code. So that request, I think, is before you. Maybe it wasn't noticed, and I don't know about the notice. Maybe you have to amend, continue this until the next hearing in order to agendize it. To me, that's over process. <clears throat> and I don't know if county council, if I ask a question, county council, and whether they are allowed today to agendize that subject on another hearing in, in a month. Mr. Hyde, that's that? going to be one of my questions of our attorney. Okay, that would be that Thank would you. be what I would I would request that you do because that's that's what we're asking you to do today, okay. and we're asking you to continue this hearing so that it can be held in abeyance until this is done. We don't believe that this is that should be that big of a problem. I got to say, you know, I think that this whole issue has been overblown. The only thing that has to be studied to determine whether to amend the code is whether a deck in the side yard ever makes sense. Ever makes sense. Don't have to conclude it makes sense in all cases because every one of those decks still requires a site plan approval. Case by case basis can be denied, approved, or conditioned. So to me, that's just about a small amend a text amendment and such a common sense text amendment I can think of. And I made this same pitch to the planning director at the hearing that when she, this was denied. And all I got was this, a very pointed statement by Dan Clayman that said, if you think we're going to amend the code, it's not going to happen. So what, would, what could we do? We've done what we've tried to do is to bring it to you and ask you to assist this community to change the code and to do it sooner, not later. Should have been done by the staff, in my opinion, years ago. And to say that it hasn't been brought up before, I mean, I went to, when I built my home addition three years ago, I pursued a deck on the side and they denied the, the, the zone clearance for the building permit because of the deck. I have another friend that's building a house right now, a, a, a remodel. He says, yeah, I wish I'd have known about this before I cut the deck off three feet and my plans that are now being built because... I tried to get it approved and couldn't. Um, new homes have been denied a, a deck because of the same ordinance. On the other hand, yesterday I saw a house at Muscle Shoals, brand new, being built, second story. What's on the side? Stairway going up to a deck on the second story because that's where the entrance of the house is, on the side. That's a building permit, just done. It's in framing stage right now. Again, I didn't bring you a photograph because I thought it was not kosher. So... Um, so now let me move to this issue of these posts on the side. Uh, you know, and this whole issue about the deck on the other neighbor's property. It's very simple. It, it, the easement is, becomes irrelevant. The applicant is Kelly. The, property, the improvements on Kelly, if they can build it because there's no you know, prohibition of a deck in the side yard, the application would be approved. With the, side yard prohibition, with the deck prohibition, the application shouldn't be approved. Simple as that. The easement's irrelevant. Um, the, the posts, on the other hand, I think can stay. We've, we, we were told to maybe modify the plans. We've, uh, Mr. Wesner said, why don't we do that? I said, 
That's a good idea. We submitted a plan showing the post. So at least today, you could approve that m modification of the plan, which has been filed, and defer the issue of the rest of the deck. Because the rest of it is a deck on Kelly. I submit the posts are not a deck on Kelly. There is no deck under that plan on Kelly. The deck is on Cranston. It's legal on Cranston because it was approved. The posts have never been approved, but they're not a deck. They're suspended in air, attached to, to the, to the pro property next door, and there's no, no, no anti-post ordinance in the side yard setback that I know of. I think it's no different than attaching a flagpole. I think Kelly could do that too. I think they could put the posts on the ground next to the deck, and they could do that as well. There is no post ordinance. There's a deck ordinance, and there's no deck on Kelly technically. So you can use that technicality and that interpretation to approve it and solve this, what is really a $10,000 problem to move, the, to move the railing, or you can not and be technical like, that's, like the staff has insisted that you do. <coughs> um, so in conclusion, I just would like two actions from you. One, to agendize a hearing for the, to, to uh, adopt a resolution to re recommend a change of the code. And two, approval of the of new site plan showing the, the posts on the Kelly. And third, an, a, a continuance of this hearing for the balance of the application for six months. And then they don't have to pay another filing fee to come back and do the same thing. If you have any questions, I'm happy yeah, Questions please. to the speaker? Comments? Mr. High? Yes, sir. Were you able to contact any other homeowners associations up and down the line in the county? Yes. The homeowners association at Solomar didn't have a meeting between the two hearings, and their meeting is today, so they couldn't take formal action. Roger Myers is, is from the Feria Homeowners Association, is the president. I think he's here, or if he's not, he's coming. He had two court calls at 8.30. He said he'd be here immediately after, um, so he could talk to that. I understood their property manager was going to be here today for Feria. Uh, Seacliff, I understood the president was also coming. Um, so they're here. That's, there's a lot of people in the audience. Are these matters within the, muni within the cities, coastal cities, resolved through the city? No. These are, all county area. these are all county area. That's why you're not, we're not talking about Oxnard Shores right. or any of the other gazillion houses up and down the beach. We only have these three, communi four communities. There's a few houses at Rincon Point. I, maybe 15 of them I didn't contact. There's a few houses north of uh, Neptune's Net down at the south end, north of the county line. There's probably 15 houses there, and that's, that's, what we're, that's all, an entire sum of the county uh, beach areas. If you had to estimate what the total number of homes we're talking well, about? Well, at, at the four I'm talking about, on the photographs you got, it's about 300. Okay. Thank you. There's 150 it, at, at Faria. Does that represent, representation include... Uh, uh, the Silver Strand uh, community? No, no, or because it's it in the city. No, it's not. Oh, it's not? No, it's not. Well, then you got Silver Strand as well, and I didn't know and that. Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Beach. I, I, that's an island down there I didn't realize was uh, in the county area. I sensed, uh, Mr. High, I sensed by your, by, uh, your comments today and, and uh, what, you, what you represented at the previous meeting that you're kind of backpedaling on some of the representations you made about about the issue of a filing, potential filing fee and and input or, or, or contribution by other property owners via associations to get this thing moving. I, I, don't, make, I don't know if I made a representation. You, I had a hope you, that you, I could do that, but well, I don't think that's going to happen. Your comments went in that direction, but I sense by your clarification letter and your comments today that we're back stepping from that at this it, time. It, well, if, if between now and the time, if, if this doesn't happen, and the only way that this can happen is through a privately funded um, application, 
then my efforts to get contributions from all the homeowner associations would not be over. I, I, I don't think any of those, the, the residents or the associations or myself, thinks it should be done by private money. I think that it's a county ordinance, the county adopted it, county created the problem, and now the county should fix it. They, they adopted an ordinance that doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry, it doesn't. It never did. It never solved any problem. It only created problems. And now with the requirement of building houses up in the air, up, 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 you know, raised off the deck, that, that ordinance needs to be made consistent with the necessary design of new houses. And, you know, it's a county situation. They should fix it. If you, if you don't, then I suppose that we might go back and try to get contribution from those associations. If those okay. associations, remember, have got, you know, those people who don't have decks and those people that do, those people that have new houses that d couldn't put a deck on <laughs> and those that have old houses that may need to. So... You know, it, there's a conflict there of when you have an association trying, using association money funded by 100% when, when, when you've got a constituency that doesn't have a need to care. So it's a problem. I mean, it, it's not an easily solvable one for those okay. associations. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yes. Armstrong. Ken, what is six months going to buy you? Well, i I, I got to say that I still believe to conclude that a deck is good in some, in at least some circumstance, shouldn't be a thirty thousand dollars staff job. I don't see how it, this this subject requires such effort. It it should be able to be done. I think at least come back to you, make a recommendation, go to the board, have the board determine whether they uh, want to study it, because that's what has to happen. I mean, you have to recommend it. They have to consider whether they're going to fund it. And then if they decide to fund it, we'll have this whole issue brought up. And I think in six months that, that, that it can be resolved if it, there's an effort made to do it. Coastal Commission, I think they, are, they aren't going to, I, when, when they're approached by us and the associations and they realize that it doesn't hurt anything, um, I don't think they're going to oppose it. So construction would remain in abeyance. Of course. What's the detriment to the county of the, of the delay? I understand your position earlier, but what's the detriment? The detriment would be a, a more of a budget impact on the planning department, right? We would have to come back again before this body on this very same issue, right? So so either way, it, you know, the, the item is properly before you. I think you should weigh in on it because so our staff doesn't have to come back in six months and, and give you a report on on where we're at, right? And then, you know, and then um, it, it, it's going to be longer than six months. I don't, if the board directed me to do it tomorrow, I don't have the staff to do it, right? I still I'm have talking, to, I have to put it in line with things. I mean, I can't imagine about, anything happening in six months. I'm not talking about the direction to do the study. I'm talking about specifically putting that project in abeyance for six months. Which is the same thing. We'll be back here again. Would you not Three. just continue the hearing? Continue. Okay. And so then I want to get to, to uh, Mr. High's point on continue the hearing. So we continued the hearing, right? And this is just this hearing discussion. Right. It isn't continuing the hearing and then so to talk about the, the other issue. And that is why, you know, we, when you use the word over process, we didn't over process anything. The hearing isn't agendized because we continued a hearing it was just on this topic. So if we do that again, continue a hearing that's just on the topic, right, then we'll be back here just on this topic. We won't be back on an agendized item to talk about decks in the side yard setback, right, right? because that's, that wouldn't be on the continued where we don't re-legal it, we don't send postcards out again. That, that's that issue, and I want to be really clear that. I was just talking about continuing the hearing on the application that before us, not to. That's what I thought. That's all, and I don't see the detriment. Yeah, but you, you, just but you just made come that back case. and check the status of the amendment, the, the text amendment. If the text amendment isn't approved yet, continue it again. Simple enough. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, so so my question would be, how long do you want to continue something that isn't conformance with the law? Because that, you know, that does cost us money to keep coming back down here on something that's not, I mean, why wouldn't we just rule on what it is and then come back? Because it's either, you know, your your client's expense for, for wanting a foot and a half deck on his neighbors, or it's my planning department's expense to keep coming down and saying it's still not consistent with the law. Okay. I, I mean, frankly, my constituency would say, We'd like to have it come back so we can have a report on the status of whether they're making progress on, the, on, on, on amending the text. Because if we don't have any forum to talk about it, where do we talk about it? Well, How do we get a report? You can make a private application. Yeah, know. that's right. But other than writing the, the, the check, right. I can't even get a report. So if I have an extension and a continuance, we can hold a feet to the fire to get something done. So you're assuming then if the staff report comes back fairly favorative, in, in favor or possibly in favor, then you would have the ability to go to the Homeowners Association and make that private application or hope that the board... No, I hope the board would agree with it yeah. and, okay. go and fund it. All right. Thank you, sir. I, Tom, I think, uh, I mean, we'll discuss it later, but I, just a general comment, I think six months is pretty optimistic. Uh, All right, to, eight to months. Expect, <laughs> to expect to have this, be able to come back and resolve this issue. That's, uh, that's fine. Um, because of other things that are as it relates to encroachment that are before the board and, and uh, not on this issue, but others, and yeah. it's a long, lengthy process. Just one comment more I forgot to mention. On the, to, if you accepted our interpretation that the posts are not a deck and therefore don't violate the code on the Kelly property, that would allow Mr. Cranston to get his certificate of occupancy, which the county revoked. They issued it, and then they revoked. Yeah. Commissioner Dukas. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hyde. Thank you. Commissioner Dukas. I was wondering if staff could respond to the contention by Mr. Hyde that posts are just like uh, flagpoles, they're not the deck. Uh, how does staff respond to that? Well, I, first I want to bring your attention that the building official is here, so I'm not sure if, if, if he wants to, to weigh in on, on or you want his expertise on, on any of that topic as well. But I'll let Dan talk to that, and then Mr. McDonald, if, if you're inclined. Yeah, actually, Ms. Deanna was going to address this in the rebuttal, but might as well just go ahead and address it right now. Um, Section 8175-4 of the Coastal Zoning Ordinance sets forth what structures are allowed um, within the setback areas. It addresses balconies, fire escapes, stairways, porches and decks, chimneys and fireplaces, heating and cooling equipment, depressed ramps and roof structures, antennas, and that is it. There is no exception allowed for uh, railings uh, for decks. And <laughs> basically to, <laughs> to detach the railing from the deck, it's like saying, okay, my finger is not part of my hand. This is a finger. It's not the hand. You know, so it's like dis disassembling the, the p component parts of a structure and saying it's not a deck. It's a support structure with concrete and rebar and stuff, but it's not a deck. Okay. It's <laughs> All right. And uh, the, the other was uh, approval of a new site plan that's not before us either. The, it's the stamped one from February 24th or whatever. The... the the new site plan includes the 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 railing on the side rather than um, the the way that it was approved or sort of got in. Yeah. So just to clarify, so your your commission's direction to the appellant at the last hearing was return to us with a modified site plan um, that you would like to have approved in lieu of what they originally proposed. So what they did is they just prepared as built plans for what's out there and said, hey. This is our modified site plan. But as we discussed in our staff report back to you, we said, hey, even that modified site plan doesn't comply with setback requirements. Therefore, we cannot recommend approval of either the original or the modified site plans. So thank, if they move thank the you. post on top of the deck, it's okay? Yes. Once again, because we approved that. Uh, once again, we didn't mean to, and it was done in error, but because we, we did approve that, it was built. Uh, I mean, it, we did approve that. We're going to allow that to go. We, we're, we're saying you can't have the railing on top of the deck as shown in that uh, permit adjustment site. The plan. railing on top of the deck is exactly what we approved. Right. So, of course, we would say, yes, you so can build if they, that. If they moved it, they would get their certificate of occupancy. Yeah. Yeah. 
And just to clarify, minor technicality, it's not a certificate of occupancy, it's final inspection, I believe. Uh, Mr. McDonald's here, the building official. It's a C of O, excuse me. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker, I have a Nancy Caldwell. Good morning, Commission members. My name is Nancy Caldwell. I own the property at 6766 Breakers Way, which is listed on the application with my brother, John Kelly, who could not be here today. First, I would like to reiterate, Mr. High speaks for the Cranstons only, <clears throat> and he is not authorized to speak on our behalf. Secondly, I'd like to ask that the Commission members address the application at hand. My understanding is the purpose of this hearing is to either approve or deny this permit application appeal and not for the purpose of changing the building code. Although we are not at liberty to give our opinion on the Cranstons extending their deck onto the easement area in which we own the land, the merits of this application appeal should be based on the building code as it exists today, not as some might wish it to be in the future. This process has been going on for several years and this application has been de denied on numerous occasions by your staff. We are hoping to finally have a resolution to this matter today. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Steve Bennett. Coincidentally. Coincidentally, Steve Bennett. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Would you... Uh, Again, repeat, for the record, repeat your name and give us your address, please. Yes, my name is Steve Bennett. I'm a co-owner of the property that is on the north side of uh, Brian Cranston's house. And I spoke with you at the last uh, hearing regarding this uh, matter. Um, this, is, this is a tough one for you guys, and it's tough for all of us. And um, I think that it got created because of the zoning ordinance being approved and being in place for so long and no one really enforcing what was being built on these properties. Um, my, my family's property was built in 1947 originally. Um, it was moved to Muscle Shoals in 1952. So I've seen in my lifetime, I was born in 55, uh, but I've seen in my lifetime lots of changes in the coastal zoning ordinances. I actually was involved in helping with uh, drafting some of the verbiage for the coastal zoning ordinances. Um, I've worked with uh, supervisors here in the county regarding these issues for many years. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is a tough one. Um, I understand about structures. I'm also a builder, by the way. I've gotten building permits in the county here. Uh, I worked for um, developers in the county as well um, and advised them at one point to stay away from coastal, <laughs> coastal properties because of these kinds of issues. Um, so... Um, I, I can't advise you either. I would like, personally, the legal issues and everything involved with the easement and all this kind of stuff, I'm looking at a three-inch railing hanging over, hanging over into an easement area that they have a right to use. And so I go, why, are we, why would you cause them to spend the money to move the railing? I suspect, I don't know for a fact because I haven't even asked this question, I suspect the reason they put it on the side there was it was temporary um, because they were trying to get this deck extended. They didn't want to drill holes through the concrete on top to damage their deck if they were allowed the the extension. So I, I suspect that's what happened. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm, that's my own opinion. Um, anyway, I, I brought some pictures. I don't know if you guys have, I, I know that you had mentioned that you'd walk the property up there and stuff. I have photographs showing what Brian Cranston's property and deck looks like from my, my, my family's property. I'd like to share it with, with you if I can. I'm sorry I don't have copies. Um, I don't know if that's appropriate to pass if, that up. If you, if you provide them, we the, They'll be entered, and you want us to consider them to have to be entered in the record. And oh, that'd be great. You wouldn't be able to give them back to you. That's fine. Is that okay with the commission? If you hand them to the clerk, I please. I appreciate that. Thank you. The reason I'm sharing the photographs with you is that, as a builder, um, I'm I'm very aware of building codes here, and I was completely unaware, I've been at the hearings for this property, completely unaware that they were going to build against a property line with, with a structure like this. Uh, I've never seen that allowed before in the county, and I was stunned at it. And I also approached the building inspector on site from the county uh, during the pour of the concrete and said, well, what is going on? How did they get approval of this? And he said, it's approved. 
it's on the plans and they're allowed to build these decks right up against the property line, elevated. And I was stunned. And I have another friend down the street that's a builder as well that's been building the county for over 40 years. And he was stunned as well. He couldn't believe that they were allowed to do this. And of course, now we've learned that it was a mistake. And I understand how it happened. And I can't blame staff for that either. I think that was pretty <clears throat> shady to say, <laughs> to kind of put it in those kind of terms. I'm, uh, but I, I thought that was kind of odd that it was able to slip in like that. Um, I've had an issue with the lighting on this house as well. And the lighting was never um, uh, the specifics of what kind of lights are going to be put, installed on this house were never presented in any of the plans. And after all of the hearings were closed and everything, they installed lights that I, I thoroughly object to. Um, they're flat panel LED lights that light up everything away from the house and nothing on the decks or anything. And as, as, as Michelle knows, I've been filing complaints about that and trying to do something about it, but they're saying that there's nothing that can be done about that as well. So again, I think it's another process where it was missed in the plants and it was allowed to be installed and you know the neighbors are gonna have to put up with it now. Um, but, but again, um, the, the reason I wanted to show, show those photographs with you is that the flood department, uh, my understanding is the flood department are the ones that are directing these new elevations for these homes. And if you look at, at the side lot there, you'll see what the original elevation of the property was before they built this house. And then you'll see that you know it gets taller and taller as it goes towards the ocean. It's over five and a half feet tall uh, next to my property on, on the ocean side there. And you'll see the exposure. I've drain pipes running through that structure, and, and all of that's exposed to my property now. And what I'm being told now is that unless we get this zoning ordinance changed, I can't build anything to block that other than a fence at elevation. I can't bring my, my house is going to have to be, if I build a house there, it's going to have to be at the same elevation as this deck, but I have to have my walkway down on the ground. And that makes absolutely no sense at all. And I have uh, photographs here also of a uh, house down the street that was uh, recently built under permit that has walkways elevated to their front door, front and back, on um, both side lots. And it should be allowed, in my opinion. I think they should be allowed to do that. You're talking about very expensive beachfront properties. Every inch counts, as staff is kind of pointing out with their three-inch, you know, railing overhanging onto the property line. So, but it's a tough, it's a tough issue, and I and I, I I appreciate you guys considering this and asking questions and and your interest in trying to learn the history of, of all this and maybe what we should do next. And I would hope that we would go forward and recommend to the, the uh, Board of Supervisors to direct staff to look at making changes in the zoning ordinance so that we can not have these issues coming up consistently and having individual property owners like myself have to fight the county staff <laughs> on trying to build things that are already built and already exist in the county. So anyway, and I, and I thank you for your time. Thank Any you. questions? Questions of the uh, speaker? Um, what's your sense of, of the community's support or non-support of this t um, proposed text amendment that we may or may not recommend to the board? <laughs> um, every property owner that I've talked to that owns property up there is in support of having a zoning ordinance change. Absolutely. Because they know it affects their property and their future of their property. Mm -hmm. And how many people would you say you know? Um, in my in the immediate community up there, I know every property owner that's that's up there in Muscle Shoals, um, but I would say that I know uh, several dozen people that own properties up and down through Solomar and several other communities, Faria Beach, areas like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. The uh, final speaker card I have is Janet uh, Kamenite. Kamenite. Again, if you'd give, repeat your name and give us your address, please. It's uh, Janet Caminetti. Oh, Caminetti. Uh, actually, apologize. I'm a real estate agent with Sotheby's International Realty, so I'm not going to comment on the current code, and I understand what the current issues are. But I did want to just second or third the, mo the, the opinions of Ken and Mr. Bennett. Um, most of those beachfront properties are very, very narrow, and they run vertically to the beach. So I'd say the average width is probably 34 to 38, 39 feet, especially in Solomar and along Faria. It could be a little bit wider. So those side yards are extremely important to each one of these properties. 
and the use of those properties. Um, some of the houses and cottages, for example, in Solomar are, were built in the 40s and the 50s, uh, a lot later. There are so many decks and so many sidewalks that have been either approved or permitted at one time that are existing that would really seriously impact the value of those oceanfront properties. I mean, the, I've sold properties there. That's my main focus is the oceanfront. And I've sold properties from values of 1.5 to $7 million along that coast. And they're paying property taxes on those purchase prices. So I think I can say pretty clearly that the impact of not changing the code or not considering a change in the code uh, would have a, a serious impact on the values. And also, as an agent and also on behalf of owners, I'm looking at a disclosure issue. Because a lot of these cottages are being torn down or majorly remodeled. And how do we disclose where we are as far as the code is concerned and what they're allowed to do and not to do? I mean, obviously, I always recommend local architects that work with the Ventura County Planning Department and the Building Department because they know better than anybody um, what's allowable and what isn't. But unfortunately, we're getting a lot of people that are coming from Los Angeles, from out of state, that are buying these second homes along the coast, and they bring in their own people. So all I'm saying is that I am in support of a review, at least, of this code to try and modify the text that would support the values and the homeowners, and we're talking three to 400 homeowners, just along between Solomar, as they said, Faria, Muscle Shoals, Seacliff. So, thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments? Um, I need to regress just a little bit. It just the discussions raise an issue in my mind. Point of disclosure on my part. Um, I'm a beach resident impacted by coastal zoning ordinance issues, as, as staff is aware. And, uh, and I've gone through a variety of these issues as well, personally. Um, I just say that because that's part of my point of foundation here. Thank you. Okay, um, anything else from staff? Okay, I, I, I just have a couple of, of quick points that I want to address um, that I heard Mr. High say, and I, I want to put back on the record, you know, this, this idea of what he, what he said verbally and what he wrote about, you know, being a hit list. You know, clearly, so your commission knows that we are not a proactive enforcement county, right? We would never, through pictures that were submitted, um, ever go out and, and do any proactive enforcement on the beach. So that, that just doesn't happen. Um, we didn't ask for the names and the addresses. We only asked for the addresses. He submitted photos and we were trying to get a, a feeling of looking in the address and looking in the file to see whether they were permitted before the code, if the decks were permitted at all. I mean, just so we could get a flavor of what that was since he submitted the photos. So, but there was never any t intent to you know, have any enforcement action. So I, I really like to clarify that every time I can because it's just um, absolutely not true. Um, you know, the, the over-processing idea I've already addressed. I said we're not over-processing anything. We are just uh, following the law as far as legal noticing goes. Um, Mr. High said that uh, he, the staff was asking you to be technical. That's because it's a technical field that we do, and it is, uh, you know, we're, we're following the law, we're following um, uh, the, the purpose and intent of the setbacks, we're following building on your own property, those kind of things. So it's a technical field, and yes, we're asking you to, to make technical decisions. So, so that is true. And then I also heard Mr. Kai saying that, you know, that it, the situation being what it is, that you shouldn't approve it, right? You shouldn't approve something that the code disallows. And, I, and I've heard him say that, and we've had a conversation about that before. So I just wanted to put those things on the record. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Onstock. Am I correct in that we do not have to rule one way or another on the post that, that, that the permit indicated that the post would be constructed on top of the deck? And so that's really not before us, and that's something that doesn't require our action. Is that correct? 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, that's correct. I, I suppose I wasn't here at the hearing where, where I guess they were directed to submit some some new plans to say whether you wanted to weigh in on those new plans or not. So the the discussion was, did so did he build what he was allowed to? No, right. And then I guess are we going to let the let that three inches of of decks on the side stay that way? And I suppose that you know you could weigh in on that issue. So there's no action required of us. All he has to do is construct according to those plans. That would be my desire to construct according to the plans. And, Mr. Chair, no, just to make and if he reason. does, he will get his certificate of occupancy. Can I can I have you come up? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I know who you are, but go ahead and state your name and position. My name is uh, Jim McDonald. I'm the building official for Ventura County. Yeah. Jim, hey. if I may, Mr. Chair, Please. I apologize, oh, yeah. sir. I'm trying to get this clear in my mind because now we're getting down to that little narrow point here. Um, if we deny this and Cranston is required to build according to the plan that was approved and he does so, then at that time you'll do your final inspection and issue a certificate of occupancy. Is that correct? I, I believe so. I'm not familiar with the plans that have been submitted, so I don't know what they reflect. Let Presumably, if they're on his own property, the answer would be yes. Let me re uh, revise my question. If that is correct, that it does do what the county approved, then you would, in the final inspection, approve it according to the plans that he's, he's of, got to get. Of course. And then he, he would receive a certificate of Yes, he would receive his final. Uh, assuming there's no other violations. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Would he not be allowed a certificate of occupancy if we had some kind of um, uh, holding the violation in abeyance, you know, recommendation? Well, the process of obtaining a final inspection approval and a certificate of occupancy for a dwelling involves a number of steps that have to be followed. You have other agencies that have to approve it, zoning being one of those. So with zoning standards relative to setbacks and so forth, if the zoning standards are in compliance and we have evidence of a zoning approval and other agency approvals as well that are normal to any project, uh, and then there are no building code violations uh, that are outstanding, we would not uh, uh, restrain issuing the uh, CBO. I'm not sure I'm not sure that I understand if it was this Commission's desire to say um, uh, for now can we uh, not enforce the the violation that these this was not built to plan uh, he couldn't get his uh, certificate of occupancy until that was resolved am I correct well, let me, let me state that I am not really well versed in this particular issue. I know we have a deck that was constructed up to the property line with railing across the property line. Is that accurate? Yeah. The railing, if the railing is extending across the property line, the issue does not raise a health and safety problem that we're responsible to enforce. So the violation being acknowledged and in process of resolution, I would not withhold the issuance of a certificate of occupancy Thank for that. Thank you. I have a question. Is there such a thing as a temporary certificate of occupancy? There is. The Could building you explain code that, has, please? I'm sorry? Could you explain that, please? The process of a, the temporary certificate of occupancy allows the building official to issue the certificate for either a portion of a building or, uh, or, uh, um, or the entire building for a limited period of time. <clears throat> the difficulty in issuing a temporary certificate of occupancy, excuse me, <clears throat> for a limited period of time is coming back and actually enforcing it after you've let them occupy the house. Now, Mr. Cranston had occupied the property. We did provide a final inspection and an approval of that, and then it was brought to our attention that the deck or the railing was actually across the property line and did not comply with the plans. So we revoked the final inspection approval, but we've not asked Mr. Cranston to move out of the property. And the certificate of occupancy would be a, is really a technical 
step forward for legalization of, com of approved occupancy, but the issue we're dealing with with this rail does not present a health and safety problem as would, for example, a second floor deck that is up against the property line that serves as a primary exit for the second floor. It's too close to the property line. Should there be a fire on the neighboring property, you block the required exit out of the building. I don't believe this is the issue with Mr. Cranston's property. Does that answer your question, uh, Richard? Yes, it does. So in essence, he's uh, the resident is in occupancy on a temporary basis. Yeah, in, in, in essence. And we've stayed any additional action on it in anticipation that this will be resolved. And there's, you know, and, and the ability for Mr. Cranston to construct his railing or a portion of his deck across the neighboring property from the building code standpoint, if the property owners have a recorded document, they've agreed to that, we would not object to the construction taking place, but that would have to be an agreed uh, a document recorded on on the pri primarily on the neighboring property where the construction has taken place. Okay, thank you. Um, aside from all the administrative issues that would result from the occupancy uh, certificate being issued, without it, uh, I'm presuming that if the property was intended uh, for resale constructed for resale, and I'm not saying that's the case here, but it couldn't proceed because there's no certificate of occupancy issued. I would imagine that could happen in the process of going through the title report, could find that the permits are not final and that the certificate of occupancy is not issued, and therefore it could hold up a, a, a transfer of property. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, we have no more speaker cards. Uh, I think we can close the public hearing. Um, we have, do we need a motion for discussion? Or do we? That's a good idea. We're going to take a five-minute break here. Uh, it's seven after we back in. It's okay. Uh, we're back in session. Um, we are about to uh, start the deliberation discussion. However, I have a. Uh, I uh, just received another speaker card on item 7, so uh, would the Commission uh, consider reopening the um, public hearing to allow the speaker? Yes. Yes, yes? okay, thank you. Mr. Meyer. Thank you very much. I'm Jay Roger Myers. I live at 3540 Pacific Coast Highway. That's part of the Faria Beach uh, homeowners. Uh, we have 134 uh, homes on Freya Beach. I'm actually the president of the association, but I'm speaking as an individual, not as a, not as the president of the association. Uh, we would support the amendment of, of uh, changing the ordinance. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Freya Beach, but it has uh, one section of it is behind gates, and it has two rows of houses there. One, one, one row of the homes are off the, off the beach, and the others are on the facing it. I would estimate we have uh, between 80 and 90 decks on the ocean side, and I know that many of them do not conform to this ordinance and haven't for for a long time. And obviously, we'd like to see some conformance. Uh, <clears throat> some of these uh, some of these decks actually tie in with the structure of the seawalls. And the seawalls protect the Pacific Coast Highway, the railroad tracks, and uh, Highway 101. And I know that the Coastal Commission doesn't always agree that uh, that the seawalls serve a purpose, but they certainly do in, in Freya Beach. And I would urge the uh, Commission to recommend uh, uh, the amendment of this ordinance to the Board of Supervisors. I know that uh, Supervisor Bennett is uh, supportive of it and uh, I'd like to recommend or, or ask, the, ask the commission to do exactly that and that is to recommend that the ordinance be amended and uh, send that on to the uh, Board of Supervisors. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr. Mar. Uh, questions? No, thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and close the public uh, hearing. Wait a minute, I have one more speaker.
Good morning. Uh, my name is William Ulrich. I'm representing uh, Benton and Maryland Lane at 2984 Solomar Beach Drive. Um, they are uh, uh, interested parties relative to having a similar condition at their property. Um, they've uh, engaged in, with the uh, planning division regarding a matter. They have a code violation that is currently pending on their property, clouding title. And uh, most of the matters that have been brought before you this morning are appropriate to their situation, but I, so I don't want to belabor the issue. However, I would like to say one thing very specifically. This is a public agency matter. Uh, the planning division is a public agency, supported by significant taxpayer dollars. Um, the lanes support uh, the comments made by Mr. Offerman this morning, by the initiatives that are uh, proposed and perhaps promoted by Supervisor Bennett, uh, but simply stated, uh, the public agency using public dollars should be processing this much needed change, considering that this earlier comments and earlier meetings as well as this morning seem to indicate that this is a functionally a budgetary issue. And while um, I don't want to minimize that, um, I do not believe that the public, from a practical perspective, and specifically several, I think, hundred taxpayers should be held hostage as a consequence of basically budgetary maneuverings. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no, no speak, more speaker cards. We'll go ahead and close the, uh, the public hearing and uh, begin our deliberations. Speaker. Uh, I'd just like to, to, to discuss before we get into a motion for multiple reasons, but um, uh, that's why I asked specific questions, particularly in the representation of Supervisor Bennett's individual today. Um, I think it brings to a focal point of what we should be talking about here today, and Commissioner Dukas was correct earlier about the scope that we're keeping. It. However, we do have uh, on our agenda the ability to raise issues to the director to take forward and under, under item nine. And um, going with what staff wrote, also relying on Mr. High's letters and the testimony I just received, that it is my intent if, uh, to discuss that specific issue under item nine. With saying that, in, in my deliberation then, I'm going to take that off the table, though I take it in consideration. It was more appropriately that Mr. McDonald talked, because now we're down to the narrow of hurting an individual or helping an individual, which again gets back to one of the reasons we do exist. So in enforcing or making decisions, we need to take the individual, the person, into consideration as well as the law. So that's just kind of my feelings at this point in time without getting into the, the merits of the appeal. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to make a comment, uh, kind of trailing uh, Commissioner Wester's comments. Um, as a retired county man manager um, with fairly extensive budget uh, preparation and management experience, I, I clearly understand the situation uh, that planning is in. I understand the frustrations and requests uh, made, being made by the property owners and the public we've heard this morning. Um, and I, I would in, be inclined to discuss this also under n uh, item number nine, uh, given Mr. Offerman's representations on behalf of his supervisor. Um, it appears that uh, there, there will be some effort to, to move something forward. and. Uh, and the Board of Supervisors uh, has the ability to appropriate funding for the Planning Commission to move forward on this uh, um, in whatever fashion is necessary. It's, it's something that was not obviously submitted as a budgetary issue 18 months ago when this, year budget, this year's budget we're working on uh, uh, here today is in place. Um, but that's why, that's why there's some, uh, some flex or call it reserve uh, discretionary funds available uh, for the board to consider if they choose to do that. So uh, my comments on number nine would be in that direction. I uh, have a similar 
position on item 9, raise the issue of bringing this matter back to the Planning Commission on some noticed proceeding. I'm not sure how that takes place. We'll probably discuss that when we hit item 9. Uh, I don't believe the posts are an issue. Uh, for a few dollars, I think they can move the posts and get their certificate of occupancy and have the cloud lifted. Um, I share staff's position regarding denying the modification request. Uh, it doesn't comply with the law, and to ignore it will create more and more problems for staff. The proper resolution of this is to bring this matter in front of the county and to resolve it countywide. That's all. Commissioner <clears throat> Nemeg. The Steves, that would be Steve Offerman and, and Steve Bennett. Um, <clears throat> that was a surprise. Um, uh, but if, if, if Steve Bennett says that uh, he supports taking a look at the non coastal zoning or coastal zoning ordinance, rather, uh, and making some possible amendments, he, he's a man of his word. Um, the issue at hand here, though, is um, very specific. And in, in I'm, I'm on. I'm looking at denying this just for the reasons that it's, it's you know, it's not following the coastal zoning ordinance, and uh, I mean the game of inches, three inches. Uh, well, I guess three inches in this particular case is a lot, um, but I think that could be uh, taken care of rather easily. Um, and at some point, maybe the. Uh, uh, the applicant can uh, be able to do that if they change the zoning ordinance. But I think we're going to leave that in the hands of the Board of Supervisors, and we may have some kind of additional comments in Item 9. Commissioner Dukas. Well, I would just go ahead and, and make the motion of the recommended actions to deny uh, the specific uh, matter that is before us. I'll second. Uh, comment, question of county staff. Uh, excuse me, county council. Um, I tend to agree with uh, uh, Commissioner Onstad's thoughts on the issue of the of the railing um, post. However, um, I have a question. Um, if the vote. Uh, Final vote is, is is in favor of following recommended staff action. Does the commission have? Um, I believe I know the answer. The commission has the ability to to um, put off the enforcement of the violation um, pending to for some limited period of time, pending uh, uh, some uh, ability to communicate with the board on this and get direction from the board on whether or not they're going to fund this this uh, text amendment issue or not. Are you tying that to the post? No, I'm that? just talking about, no, I just, yeah, no, I'm not. In other words, in other words, what I'm saying is if the commission supports recommended staff action, uh, the commission also has the ability to, to have enforcement uh, uh, postponed. Uh, whether it's six months or whether it's a year, that would allow so that if the commission moves forward on a recommendation under item nine of the agenda, the planning commission has the ability to put something together, bring it back for the commission and to move forward to the board. That's correct. As part of a motion um, upholding the staff's recommendations, you can direct staff to um, refrain from enforcing the the, the rail issue um, for a, a specified amount of time. So could I add that as an amendment to my motion? That recommendation? Certainly. Second will support. Okay, we have a... Oh, wait a minute. Excuse oh, me. What's the time period? Well, uh, the yeah. motion is to, to hold enforcement for one year. We're going to discuss it. Yes, we're that's, going to that's discuss the that. issue for discussion. I refer back to staff. What's the impact of continuing? I touched on this once before, as did you. The impact of continuing this for one year. 
Well, as, as yeah, I understand, we're focused on the, the three-inch encroachment right now, not not on the. I assume we're not on talking about the application for minor modification. As I understand what your motion is, that you are saying that you are going to support staff's recommended actions and saying, no, you can't build a one foot nine inch deck right. in your neighbor's property. But, and so that's a no, right. but we're not going to enforce the three inches where you built your rail illegally. We're going to say you can't do that either, but we won't enforce that violation for a period of Time. That's what I understood it right. to be. Right. Okay. And the impact is what you said before. Well, no, the impact for that is a little different because we're not going to have to come back down. You're already saying it's illegal. Yeah. And so we would just put that tickler into our system and saying we're going to let the deck stand for one year. And at one year, one day, we're going to go out and say, did something happen? Or. So we're not continuing a hearing. You're just no. staying enforcement to a state. Exactly. Okay. And, and, I, I just, oh, sorry. I just want to add one technical addition. Um, we, we in the planning division, we haven't issued a notice of violation. We haven't taken any enforcement actions with regard to the three inch encroachment. Um, it's the building and safety division who has um, taken enforcement actions so far and it's just been rescinding the final inspection which also serves as a certificate of occupancy. So I think it's just prudent to have Mr. McDonald confirm that they are not going to take enforcement action for a year just, just to clarify that and it sounds like he they are amenable to that I think uh, you in essence said this exactly that previously that's correct yeah we, we would pursue let me, let me any reopen the, let me reopen the hearing and allow okay. you to speak go ahead uh, we uh, we wouldn't uh, pursue any additional enforcement action in anticipation of this matter being resolved sometime in the next year it would make perfect sense to do that it's not a health again it's not a health and safety issue that presents a risk to the property owners or the public. This is uh, an issue of constructing over the property line by three inches. Well, what happens from your perspective after the expiration of one year? Nothing. Well, no, from unless my they, perspective. Unless they initiate something. They mean planning. Uh, say that one more time, sir. I'm assuming that since it's not a health and safety issue, after the expiration of one year, if the matter has not been resolved, you probably wouldn't take any action, but you would look to plan. Yeah, we, what we would be looking for, and I would presume planning would be asking for documents that reflect both property owners' concurrence for the construction across the property lines. If we have that, then, uh, uh, then, then we would be able to final it permanently. But we would withhold additional enforcement over the next year, uh, and we would be able to issue a certificate of occupancy or a temporary certificate of occupancy until the matter is resolved in some other form over the next year. Okay, I, I asked Kim that earlier about postponing the co-enforcement, correct? I mean, I don't think anybody knows what kind of time frame this possible coastal zoning ordinance change would take place. Is there any any time frame at all on that guesstimate? There isn't a time frame because I'm not sure of the scope and the scale of even the issue yet, right? So, and that that's, that in and of itself takes a lot of work, right? Where you have to go through uh, the effect of changes on the deck, the differences in development standard, the public outreach, the Coastal Commission exception, right? And so the last time, as you're well aware, we went through that phase one, and that was about a two and a half year process. So, I mean, I, I think what I heard um, Mr. Offerman say this morning is that um, the former commissioner, Mr. Brennan, is going to reach out to the Coastal Commission staff, right? Because sometimes that that is the, the issue, right? So if they're going to go to them right away and saying, let's talk about this and they might be on board, well, then we might be down to a shorter period of time. But, you know, we would also have to talk about perhaps hiring staff to do that and, and letting the board set a priority. The board's already given us work to do, right? And we would have to ask them where they would want us to fit this and in, in our other priorities that we have right now. So there's so many unknowns that, you know, there's no way that I could say that this could be done in a year. I think a year would be completely optimistic. I'd like to withdraw my uh, motion altogether. Second will support it. So I guess my question is, why we, if we're, if we're not going to do anything about those posts, we're only not going to do anything about it for a year. 
why wouldn't we just not do anything until such time as a coastal zoning ordinance is changed or not changed? Otherwise, it makes no sense. I think it'd be cleaner and you'd have more finality and more clarity if we went ahead and we, uh, I, I'll offer this up again, to move staff's recommended actions with the idea in mind that we've got this other um, item on our agenda where we can make recommendations to the board. But just have it um, clean and, uh, and deny. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second to uh, all recommend staff action. Oh, good, I did it right. Okay. Uh, a motion passes. We'll, we'll, we'll have comments during uh, item nine of the agenda today. Okay, moving on uh, the agenda. Um, item eight, uh, consideration of demand for planning commission to cure or correct uh, alleged violations of Brown Act. Uh, you, want to, you want to take that out of, out of order so these people might get the government. Yeah, I, uh, I've got a request to uh, uh, amend the order to address that, that secondary issue now since the participants are here now. Um, and it would be interrupted otherwise with, with what may be a lengthy hearing. Um, do I have a motion to uh, amend the agenda to uh, hear item nine now? I'll make the motion that we switch eight and nine. A second. I need a second. Second. No, I think it's entirely. Okay, yeah. and then I, and then I think we ought to do that. Okay. Um, so let's move. Uh, we're going to move to item nine discussion. Uh, uh, report uh, by the planning director on on board issues and matters, as well as items the planning commission may want to introduce. Uh, and we have Commissioner Onstott with a question. Uh, planning director. We refer this matter, the form of the motion to refer this matter to you. You indicated that it would be appropriate to do a preliminary study, a preliminary review, and then report back to us. Is that, and on a noticed hearing, is that what you're saying? Well, the language says, you know, in, in the several ways to, to change the ordinance, it says, by the adoption of a resolution of intention by the Planning Commission setting the matter for a hearing. So I imagine that that's what you'll do. You'll set the matter for a hearing, and then at that time, you know, we could, you could ask us exactly, you know, what is it that you want us to study, or we'll come back with some preliminary information to, to give you some comfort of whether you want to support it, support sending it to the board, or not send it to the board. I'm not sure, and I would have to talk to Mr. Offerman based on his conversation today, whether we would even be able to come back and be before you with that agendized hearing to, to discuss that before Mr. Bennett perhaps would bring it, uh, Supervisor Bennett would perhaps bring it before the, well, before the Board of Supervisors. Yeah, my question is, do we refer it to you or do we, we make this motion toward the Board mm -hmm. to jumpstart this thing? They're really... Yeah. yeah, that was the point One I was going to make. Five isn't good enough. No, but he has the voice of the, the board to make that. Yeah. It so what's the best way to proceed? Yeah. It would be completely up to you. If you wanted me to study it and come back and provide you some preliminary information so you could make the recommendation which is being requested of you to the Board of Supervisors, that is what I'll do. Commissioner Dukas. Um, would that differ from a program of amnesty to uh, to legalize the ones that are are there now? See, and, and that you know that is typically what we would get from you to saying we would like you to investigate. Um, you know, not only what the issues are, but what it would take to fix it. We want to talk about amnesty. I mean, you would give us some direction, and that's you know that's what we would that's what we would come back with. But we, we would come back with a pretty slim 
discussion, right, on what it would be just to see because it's very expensive, right? And then also we would want to understand from the board, um, you know, there's got to be three votes at the board that would direct us to do it too. So we would want to understand from the board before we spent a lot of time and energy to saying, do they want us to, to also, that you've taken a preliminary look, you think it's a good idea, we would go to the board and saying, here's, here's what the Planning Commission said, and you know, we would, we would ask for direction from the board at that time. But they prefer it vetted here first or sent straight to them? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, most of the time, as, as long as I've been here, I haven't seen this used, right? So typically somebody applies for it or the board directs us to do it. So I'm not, you know, it, it's going to, it's going to come, it's going to come before you regardless, right? If the board directs us to do it, you'll be the first people to, to hear about it because it'll come to you. All ordinances come to you before they, they're heard final by the board. But it sounds like to me, the board's going to come to you. Uh, that, that sounded like Unless what I heard this morning. Steve can't get three votes or something. Well, there's, in my mind, there's a vast difference between um, legalizing what's there now and um, having a wholesale change in policy that becomes very, very involved with, with seawalls and the Coastal Commission. There's some things that, um, you know, from a practical matter, seem like a non-starter because of, and, and extremely time-consuming uh, uh, to go through a sequence process to figure out the hydrology and, you know, all of these technical issues that go with constructing um, on the ocean front. So, um, so the... Uh, the thing that I'm more interested in is is uh, seeing if there's a program uh, to to see if some of these side decks are appropriate as built and have some kind of amnesty <coughs> program. Um, I'm less I'm I'm less enamored of the idea of saying we're just going to uh, have them in all cases. I like the the subtlety of are they appropriate in some cases and perhaps they may be. Mr. Chair, and again, it's a discussion here, so uh, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, uh, Mr. Albrecht made the point, which is very clear in staff's presentation, they have not been funded to do this. Staff does not have 16,000 people just sitting waiting to do things. Uh, it is a very complex situation, time consuming, as you pointed out, Nora, um, particularly when the Coastal Commission gets involved in these situations. So uh, I the thing that we had a supervisor send a representative, I've never seen that in 20 years up here. Okay, not good, better, and different. I'm just making the point that it is now at that level. So what I was thinking is that we, just a minor resolution that Supervisor Bennett and the supervisor take this up and deal with the planning staff, and then staff give them some options of what they can do now as the process and also where they'd like to go. But without... Supervisors giving you the money and hiring the extra staff, how are you going to deal with it? And on what, on what timely basis? Right. Well, we just make the recommendation. Whether or not they heed our recommendation is entirely up right. to them. Right. But again, like I said, in over 20 years, I've never seen a supervisor representative come down here. Uh, particularly, and that's why I was concerned about it coming in a public comment section. And so, all right, I've got the decision makers above me kind of giving me a picture. And now I've got to deal with that elephant in the room in my decision making. So, but what it points out to me is the importance and the, the level it's gotten to. Okay, that, that's the way I take it. So, um, whatever, I guess, I think what Commissioner Onsat saying, what do you need from us? Because you already heard from one of the supervisors. I guess I'm looking for some direction. So I hear Mr. Ken, Ken High, right? So he's asked you to agendize an item and, 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 and notify the public and bring it in to have a conversation about this um, resolution of intention um, to set the matter for hearing, right? So that's one topic. Mm -hmm. Or the other one would be a we, we did hear from a board member this morning who signaled he was going to take the issue on. We could that we could be do nothing and wait to see when he takes it on and then let the board direct us what to do and we'll be back from their direction. So, I mean, or, or, or you can not take it up altogether. It looks like you have those three options. Well, I, I've heard what Commissioner Dukas has said and I think that's one part of the discussions we need to have is 
since it is a long term and whether the budgets are there and all that, what tools can we help provide staff in dealing with this uh, on a day to day basis? So I guess what I'm hearing is that we need to set it for a hearing and then we can include all these uh, other issues as far as amnesty or whatever else and at least have an open and honest discussion with the public present. And we, and we could have that discussion and what we could do is it you know set forth um, you know a list of here's all of the things that we would explore and here's all of the options and are there things out of here that you would agree or disagree with I know that the County of Los Angeles is uh, was just recently before the Coastal Commission um, with kind of an amnesty idea and the Coastal Commission did not like that idea at all Right, so they said you comply because then we have the added layer of the whole coastal act to deal with, right? And so, you know, we would have to really explore that issue with them. How do you carefully. add amnesty on it? Because it's a case by case, you may have health and safety issues contributing. No, oh, sure. Yeah, I was just going to say one uh, component of doing a zone text amendment uh, for us as staff is we always look at okay, if the zone text amendment is approved what effect would it have on existing development out in the county? That would be subject to the zone text amendment. So for those decks that have already been built, we'd be looking at, okay, what would be the effect on those decks? Is that desirable? Would it be something that benefits the property owners? Does it comply with the Coastal Act? Is that something that you know the board would be um, looking upon favorably in your commission and your recommendation to the board? And then if anything needs to be changed, such as our regulations regarding non-conforming uh, development we would be evaluating that uh, you know making a recommendation on what would need to be changed in order to allow that if it's found to be desirable and consistent with the coast line so it's not quite amnesty but we that's one basic consideration whenever you're doing a zone text amendment which could you know facilitate those people being allowed to keep their decks if it's a good idea meets all the standards or if not it, they would then become legal non-conforming if the amendments adopted and then there are regulations uh, regarding under what consider uh, under what situations it can remain be expanded so on and so forth so. well I, I heard I heard mr. high say and um, and I believed him that there might be a reticence of you know that people may have regarding uh, you know leave well enough alone don't attract any attention and you know have have your neighbor complain, you know, that maybe they don't like how high it is, you know, there, you get a lot of neighbor to neighbor uh, uh, problems. So, I don't know why he's standing there. I don't know why he's standing there. He probably there. has something to say. I, I, I didn't know <laughs> if there was a public hearing. Is, is this, he's not, yeah. he's not I don't know if it's a public hearing. Yeah, There's, it's not open for public discussion. Thank you very much. This I is didn't. our dialogue. So, um, um, Anyway, um, I believed him when he said that, and I'm really interested th that uh, that there are hundreds of homes uh, potentially affected by this, but we've heard from around 30. So um, notice is really important that everybody gets a chance to to speak um, freely about whether you know what they want to see from this. So I think agendizing it. Um, and having it come back to us so that we have better focus um, would be a good idea. Is that a motion? Well, hang on here. No, 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 no. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. I jumped I, the gun before too. Know, there's a lot up in the air. Um, what, I, what I'd like to suggest is that we table this particular issue until our next meeting and when we have the discussion. Uh, maybe at that point, uh, Kim might have some more information in terms of where Steve Bennett is at. And does he need anything from us? And maybe at that time we can make a more informed decision. Is a motion to table? Is that f is that final? I know in some cases um, a motion to table. That's it. I don't think you need any motion because you can just you can bring this issue up again under item nine in your next meeting. Because you're you all you would be doing was introducing something for a future agenda. Well, I, I, I don't guess, like agreements to agree. Yeah, right. Uh, I would like to have a hearing in the near future right. to go over what's necessary in proposing a text amendment to the Board of Supervisors. And at that same hearing,
to discuss the immediate issues uh, as Commissioner Dukes and myself have brought up because individuals are being hurt or could be hurt, I should say. I should say that more wisely uh, because it does affect title, insurance, occupancy, a lot of other issues. And, um, you know, I understand that it ties staff's hands at times. So um, I would just like to. an opportunity to pull the supervisors all yeah, Well, I think that then we would all talk to our relative supervisors and see what's going on. But again, the final thing is, is it's raised the level for you is that you may get the funding for the budget. So I would like to have if agenda sometime in the near future. I, and I guess I'd like to understand what near future is to you. 2014. Your lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to be coy about it. But I mean, it, the the planners that do this kind of work, this in the long range, that amend the ordinance, are working on amending the Sadaquoi area plan that you've heard about, and are working on amending the Phase Two local coastal plan. And both of those are on a very tight uh, timeline for grant work. So it's not like I can pull them off because they have grant work and they have deadlines and we have deliverables on those and we're so tight on those projects, mm -hmm. right? So then it would take, uh, you know, me to assign maybe one of the managers to, to do it. And, and, you know, so realistically it would be, it would be months before we would be back here with any sort of good information. I mean, clearly we would want to have, if we want to have a workshop, we would want to hear from the community. We would want to have some sort of background information and research and that research and, and our conversations with the board office and the Coastal Commission. I mean, all of that takes a very long time. And then just to get agendized to come back down here and prepare the staff report, that's like a five week process right there. So it will be a lengthy process before we get down here. I mean, I would say more in the four to six months. So if that's... So October, November? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just give us some kind of an update report in the middle? And then if the board end up taking that on in that interim period, right, where we got actually assigned to do it, then I would come back and, and report that back out to you as well. Kim, um, again, I, I've dealt with the, the, these issues before. Um, we're in the budget preparation process for next year. What we're talking about is is work that probably wouldn't get done until next year because of the funding issue. Um, would it benefit you um, to have the commission support uh, uh, an amendment to your your recommended budget or the submitted budget that, that the board is going to be processing sometime in the near future? to amend whatever was to include funding for this issue? Well, I, I think that if Supervisor Bennett was going to propose it, right, that it, it propose it outside of the budget perhaps, then he would already, right, have that in mind. Our budget that we submitted as the planning department and as the resource management agency clearly doesn't include that, but but the board is used to that. So when there, if there's an extra process or a project before them that they would like us to do, we typically go back and say, We've, we've looked at it, it's going to be $72,000, and they, they either provide that or they don't. So if, if the board um, um, follows uh, Commissioner Bennett's uh, request and appropriates money, mm -hmm. uh, that could be appropriate in this fiscal year and encumbered in the next fiscal year to get the work done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that could happen. So does the board need anything from us to do anything? They can take it up on their own motion, can't they? They can take it up on their own motion, and that's what I was saying. Perhaps by time before I would be able to come back to you with a realistic timeline, they might have already taken that up. But I would, I would agree. I haven't seen a board member down here before, right? So I would like to call and and ask them what kind of time frame that they're thinking about to see if we can, you know, and maybe the next time we meet, um, I could report something back to you to saying. This is their timeline, and this is the timeline I would be able to do something, and maybe those don't meet nicely, or maybe they do. And I don't know if that would be helpful for you at all. Do you, do you think you could pull uh, and gather that type of information uh, and give us some sort of report back at the next meeting under this a, a verbal, verbal response? Uh, y yes, but I don't think we're meeting again until June 19th. Oh. So. Good for us. This year. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Right now. You nailed that's me earlier, so my, my turn. Hmm. 
Mr. Chair, if I may. Commissioner Wester. I'd like to direct the planning director to acquire whatever information she can between now and June 19th and bring a, a report back to us uh, as, as far as this matter and recommendations for to proceed forward on it. Well, just anybody and everything. I mean, she's telling me there's long range planners. We've had applicants here. There's obviously applications in the process. Just to give us, bring us back an overview. Supervisors also. Yeah. If that's a motion, I'll second it. Okay. I don't know that it is, but I would support that also. So just, just to clarify, you're looking for an overview of our work load and our work product right now, or do you want an over, you want a discussion on our thoughts on setbacks? Just a review, just bring something back to us, whether it be your workload or the supervisor's discussion, just give us a, a report back so then we have information to maybe give you further direction. Okay, but so on June 9th, then we would not be um, noticing a, a public hearing on the resolution to intend. No. A director's report. Idea. Okay. Just a director's Obviously, we'd like feedback from the board. Okay. Um, you want to continue with item nine on your comments, Kim, or you want to wait till after item seven and come back to it? I'll wait till after. Okay, fine. Okay. Nothing else from the commissioners on item nine right now? Okay. Uh, regressing, uh, revisiting item uh, eight, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, consideration of uh, demand for planning commission to cure or correct alleged violations of the Brown Act regarding uh, hearing PL1300, excuse me, PL13-0011. Uh, County uh, Council. The letter is identified as a, quote, cure or correct demand under the Brown Act, pursuant to which an interested person is required to provide such a demand to the legislative body before commencing legal action regarding the alleged Brown Act violations. Uh, under the Brown Act, within 30 days after receipt of this type of demand, the legislative body must either cure or correct the challenge action or inform the demanding party in writing of its decision not to do so. I want to stress that this item is not an appeal on any substantive or procedural grounds of the Planning Commission's hearing of, of that, that actual land use matter in its decision to deny the CUP request. Indeed, the Planning Commission's decision was separately appealed in accordance with the Coastal Zoning Ordinance to the Board of Supervisors for a de novo appeal hearing. This means that the Board of Supervisors will be hearing the land use matter anew without regard to the Planning Commission's proceeding and decision that already occurred. The County Council's Office has determined that no violation of the Brown Act occurred at the subject hearing. I'll, I'll provide you with a, a brief summary of Ms. Cummings' allegations and, and the staff that, that is my office's response to each. And just to, to give you a little bit more context, Ms. Cummings' letter didn't specifically state um, or cite any, any provisions of the Brown Act and, and allege that, that any specific provisions were violated. Uh, as you can see in her March 25th letter, she made a number of general allegations regarding the hearing. 
And so what I did was go through those allegations and see which of those um, could potentially implicate a provision of the Brown Act. And, and so what I did was, was break those allegations off and address those in the context of her cure or correct demand to follow the, the letter of the law as, as best of my ability. Ms. Cummins claims not to have had the opportunity to make, quote, general comments at the March 20th day of the hearing. In fact, Ms. Cummins spoke at the hearing for over six minutes during the land use hearing portion of the meeting. In addition, at one minute and 50 seconds into that hearing day, as shown on the video recording of the meeting, Chair Rodriguez informed everyone attending the meeting of their agendized opportunity during the public comments period to address the commission regarding any matters not appearing on the agenda. Thus, Ms. Cummins was provided an opportunity to, opportunity to address, and in fact addressed at length, the Planning Commission in compliance with the Brown Act. Ms. Cummins also claims that her public testimony was improper, improperly limited when, at a pro approximately six minutes into her testimony regarding the sub subject land use matter, Chair Rodriguez instructed her not to raise issues regarding the alleged motives of a person opposing the proposed project. Chair Rodriguez's limitation of Ms. Cummins' testimony on the basis of its lack of relevance to the merits of the CUP request was consistent with the Brown Act and the county's land use hearing rules, both of which allow the imposition of reasonable speaker limits to provide for the efficient and orderly hearing of land use matters. Third, Ms. Cummins' letter states that before the March 20th hearing, she asked the Planning Division staff to give her all of Planning Commissioner Aducas's disclosures that were made at the hearing, but Ms. Cummins said she received nothing. This is more of a, a Public Records Act uh, issue in my mind, but um, nonetheless, I'll address it now. Um, in checking with Planning Division staff, staff's only recollection and record of receiving such a request from Ms. Cummins is a March 19th email that she sent to um, Brian Baca, the planning department, stating, quote, I'd like to ask the commissioners to disclose any conflicts of in interest. Consequently, this, this allegation that the planning commission somehow didn't provide disclosures does not seem to be supported um, by, by the facts. Moreover, as your commission knows, planning commission hearings are not typically transcribed so even if Ms. Cummins had asked for a document containing the commissioner's disclosures that may have been made at a, a previous day of the hearing, she would have been directed to watch the, the actual video of the hearing itself because there would be no document to provide her. Finally, Ms. Cummins states in her letter that she did not see posted on the planning division's website certain documents regarding the land use matter that the planning division received on March 19th. In other words, the, the day before the, the, the second March 20th day of the subject land use hearing. Ms. Cummins' letter does, uh, however, acknowledge that such documents were posted on the planning division's website on the, the night of March 20th. So a after the hearing had, had ended, the planning commission uh, posted documents on its website that it, it had received the night before the second day of the hearing. Under the Brown Act, members of the public are entitled to see all materials that are distributed to the Planning Commission for consideration of an agendized item at the same meeting. Had Ms. Cummins asked at the March 20th hearing to see these late received documents, she would have been provided them in accordance with the Brown Act. Um, that being said, the, the Brown Act doesn't require that a public agency make copies of, um, of late received records, which you know are oftentimes voluminous and it would be impractical to do so. So the point of, uh, of my response to that, her, her point there is that had she asked to see these late received documents at the hearing, they would have been provided to her with no issue. And so those were the, the four issues that I identified, again, that could potentially implicate the Brown Act. And, and based on the for foregoing, the County Council's office um, recommends that your commission adopt the recommended actions to reject Ms. Cummins's cure or correct demand under, under the Brown Act and authorize my office to send the response letter that's attached to the staff report as Exhibit B informing her of the rejection of her demand. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.
Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. So, um, what is this body to do at this point in time? Under the Brown Act, uh, your, your body's sole decision at this time is to either accept or reject her cure or correct demand. And um, as a follow-up to that, the, the second recommended action is if you're going to reject the demand, then to authorize my office to send the draft response letter to Ms. Cummins informing her of the rejection. And since this item has been agendized, that we are required to take public testimony? You are. Uh, the, the parameters of which should be limited to this actual Brown Act issue. Again, this is not an appeal on any basis of, of the merits of, of, of the Hauser um, CUP request hearing. It's, it's solely focused on these alleged Brown Act violations that were raised in the March 25th letter. So it's very narrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, I have a speaker card. It's Mary, first card, Mary Cummings. Cummins. Hello, my name is Mary Cummins, and I've been going to public meetings for over 25 years. Um, LA County Supervisors, LA City Council, Public Safety, Animal Services. I was also on the Prop F Committee for LA City, which oversaw $150 million in bonds for new fire departments and animal um, shelters, and I was also asked to be a commissioner. Now, the purpose of the Brown Act is to have an open and fair public meeting to discuss issues of public concern. The meetings must not just be fair, but, but, but must appear fair. All applicants must receive a fair hearing and due process of law. All commissioners must enter as neutral decision makers. Now, I do believe there were Brown Act violations. He only mentioned four of a, a few number of issues that I raised. I believe that there was, uh, with Commissioner Adicus, a conflict of interest, a pre-bias, um, lack of proper disclosures, and some ethic violations. And I believe they should render the vote void. Um, I did ask to speak in general comment, and I sent in a speaker card. I didn't hear my name called. Um, and then I asked later, and I thought maybe they'll call me later. And then she said that the public comment was closed. And I noticed today that you reopened um, public comment. Um, for other people, but I wasn't afforded the same ability to speak on public comment. And um, let's see. And I was cut off by um, Commissioner Rodriguez. I was going to speak on something which was directly related to item PL 130011. Um, he didn't even know where I was going, but I was cut off. And I, it was relative to talk about the motivation and, and actions that the uh, um, the main opposition to the CUP has opposed. Now, um, I, did, I did physically ask Jeff and Brian in email for any type of disclosures ahead of time, and I didn't receive anything. No one told me to go look at the video, or I would have. And, um, and not only that, but before the meeting, Commissioner Adducus, if I'm saying that correctly, um, she said that she did her own independent investigation and pulled up some very old listings written by the broker of the ex-owner years earlier. And um, those would be completely irrelevant to this situation or the application. And she also presented photos which she said she took of personal property. She um, trespassed onto uh, private property and took photos of personal property. And there's no trespassing signs at the entrance to their driveway and exactly where those items of personal property are. Now, I didn't see these items before the meeting. They came up during the meeting. And during the meeting, um, Commissioner Adukas um, admitted that she was on the property and she took those photos. And then she also stated that you can see the enclosure area from the trail behind the house. Um, that's physically impossible. Um, I've been up there, and if you look at Google Earth, you cannot see it. She was saying that the top of the enclosures would glint from the sun and be an eyesore to people on the trail. And then she stated that my um, satellite image showed that you can see the enclosure area from the trail. And um, I showed a satellite image, not a topographical image. There's no way you could have seen any. You could see the ocean from there. So that was not um, a true representative of what happened. And then um, one of the most important things is I've been going to these meetings for very many years. Um, I've never had a commissioner or council person or supervisor be so extremely rude and unprofessional. Commissioner Adicus was um, 
making faces at the Hausers when they were speaking. She was making faces and shaking her head side to side. Um, she was flipping her hair. She was raising her voice. She was yelling at them. Um, and she kept saying that their testimony wasn't honest because uh, there was another, uh, prop another um, improvement on the property before she bought it. And uh, what they admitted to in the application is exactly what is there. And she also stated that we, people on, um, for the CUP were chuckling when they were talking about fire, pres um, fire um, instances. And that most certainly never happened. There was only one time when the opposition stated that everyone knows all tiger owners are drug dealers, and that's probably when someone chuckled. And during the meeting, Commissioner Adukis brought up her own false arguments. First, she said that the dump would not take tiger excrement. She didn't even check it out ahead of time. Fortunately, Kim called the dump, and it turns out they would take it. And then um, Commissioner Aduka stated that she didn't think a regular truck or SUV could get down Deer Creek. Uh, I'm familiar with that road. I've been on my motorcycle on it many times, and you can get a regular SUV. Um, so that wouldn't have been an issue. She kept bringing up non-negative issues. And if anything, Mr. Sitterman, if he were to have to evacuate in a fire, he needs a long horse trail to get all of his animals out. He would not be able to go down Deer Creek. Now, um, Arena's, the Houser's lawyer, Charles Cote, he spoke during the meeting, and he said that the Houser's were going to add, um, in order to improve cellular service, to add responders. At that moment, Commissioner Aduka stated that, oh, she's going to need a CUP. It's going to have to be this large antenna. And the attorney coat asked if he could ask the Hauser, who was the Hauser who was sitting three feet away from him, if he could ask her what type of repeater. And then um, Commissioner Aduka yelled at him and says, no, this is something you have to know. And the Hausers only want to add these six-inch little, you know, non-professional repeaters. They don't need a CUP. They don't want to put up a huge tower. They weren't allowed the opportunity to give that information. And um, Aducas also stated that this was a very quiet area with, uh, and the tigers would be very, very loud. She's not a sound expert. There was no official sound expert, a sound report. Um, if anything, the dogs and the birds next door are extremely, extremely loud. And as a person who motorcycles through that canyon quite often, the motorcycles are louder than anything there. And then after the meeting, this is where things get a little bit confusing. Um, the commissioner, Aducas, came over and said, sorry, things didn't work out. And it was kind of in a rude, mocking manner. And at that point, the Hauser's um, attorney stated that um, she should have recused, recused herself because her husband works for Carlos Sitterman. Now, since then, Commissioner Aduka stated that that is not the case, but that is what I heard at that time, and that is what I was going on. And um, I did send in my letters, at least almost all of them, 72 hours before the hearing. The night before the hearing, I looked for any additional letters. The morning of the hearing, I looked for additional letters. When I finally got back home that evening, I saw additional letters that actually had been sent in more than a day earlier. So I should have been able to see those letters because um, what Mr. Sitterman wrote about me was completely defamatory and false. Um, and even recently, he sent another letter stating that I'm a cyber soccer and I've never been charged or convicted of any crime in my entire life. I don't even have a jaywalking ticket. And um, so he was trying to dismiss my testimony. So for those reasons, I believe that it was not a fair hearing. I don't believe they received a fair hearing. They were pre-biased by the statements, which were false, that um, Commissioner Adicus made. And um, she shouldn't have voted, and I believe there should be a new hearing because of her false testimony, which was pre-biased and misleading. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, my name is Andrew Guilford, and I represent uh, the owners of the property at 10995 Pacific View Road, and I also represent Carlos Siderman. And uh, just very briefly in response to Ms. Cummins, um, as clear from Ms. Cummins' letter and from the statements made today, Ms. Cummins is re-arguing the issues that underlie the particular land use determination and as county council has pointed out that's not proper and not before the commission today 
Um, Ms. Cummins is raising issues entirely unrelated to the alleged Brown Act violations, such as whether or not the neighborhood is noisy. Those issues are, not, again, not before the Planning Commission. With respect to the issues of disclosures um, made by Commissioner Adukas, again, that's irrelevant to the Brown Act determination that's um, to be made today and the cure or correct demand that's been made by Ms. Cummins. And I would like to point out that those issues were not raised on the March 20 hearing, although apparently they were known to the applicant's attorney, according to Ms. Cummins. And so any concerns about the disclosures made by Commissioner Adukas should have been raised then and were not. And they had ample opportunity to raise any of those considerations. Those, uh, that public hearing lasted for quite a number of hours. Ms. Cummins has made the assertion in her cure or correct demand that James Adukas, Commissioner Adukas' husband, worked for Carlos Siderman. That assertion is false. Mr. Siderman has submitted a letter to that effect to make clear that Mr. Siderman doesn't know and doesn't believe he's ever even met Mr. Adukas and certainly has never worked for or with Mr. Adukas. And similarly, Commissioner Adukas has never worked for or with Carlos Siderman. With respect to the narrow issue before the commission, which is the issue of the Brown Act, we fully support County Council's um, analysis of this issue. We'd like to add, since Ms. Cummins has raised this issue, um, she, it's not clear to us, but to the extent that she's claiming a Brown Act violation for any internet research that Commissioner Adukas may have done or any a visit to a public trail, uh, those activities do not implicate the Brown Act because they do not reflect a meeting under the government code and under California Supreme Court authority, the Brown Act does not prohibit Commissioner Adukas from performing such independent investigation. And absent any questions, I thank you for your time and urge you to adopt um, County Council's letter and reject the cure correct demand. Okay, thank you. I have one other speaker card, uh, Shaleen uh, Luden, Ludden. Uh, Hi, my name is Shailene Lundeen. I have been involved with many of the Deer Creek neighbors in opposing CUP PL130011. The personal and entirely fabricated attacks on members of the Deer Creek community are completely irrelevant to PL130011. At the one hour mark of the February 13th hearing, Commissioner Adukas made the following disclosure. I am acquainted with a couple of the letter writers. One worked with my husband a number of years ago. There was no conflict of interest, and Commissioner Ardukas did not have any duty to recuse herself. The claims that Commissioner Ardukas' husband was employed by Carlos Siderman made by Mary Cummins on behalf of applicant Irina Hauser are completely unfounded and an unfortunate distraction. There were absolutely no disclosure or ethics violations at either hearing. In addition, there were no Brown Act violations, and the hearings on February 13th and March 20th were both open and fair. I would like to ask that the Commission support staff's recommended action and reject demand to cure or correct alleged Brown Act violations and authorize County Council to transmit response letter rejecting cure or correct demand. Thank you. Thank you. No other speakers? Um, close the public hearing. Uh, motion. Uh, before we do that, uh, is there any further response from staff? Any further comments? It's for the record, uh, Jeff, Jeff Barnes, Assistant County Counsel, nothing that further that I heard from Ms. Cummins um, causes me to change my recommendation that you, um, you deny the cure correct demand. Thank you. Do I have a motion uh, for discussion? Mr. Chair, based on the representation testimony received and County Council's direction, uh, I move that we um, deny Ms. Cummins' request. Second. Discussion? No. Okay, let's vote.
Okay. Uh, pass. We've we've uh, approved kind of council's recommended action on this item. Uh, that concludes that item. Moving back to uh, on the agenda to item nine. Uh, oops. Sorry. Kim. Thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez. I just have a couple of quick things to, to update you on. Um, as our county council have said, the um, Hauser case has been appealed to the Board of Supervisors. We're looking for um, uh, June dates right now before the board. We tried May, but the uh, um, appellants aren't available then, so we expect the case will be here heard before the board in, in June. So I'll keep you uh, posted of when that's agendized. And then your next hearing um, so far, because there hasn't been anything else scheduled, is on um, June 19th. So when we add this item to June 19th, I would expect a rather long day because the, there's three items on there already. One's a consent, but the item that I was expecting you to have a long day on before is back on the, on the agenda, and this is um, a minor modification of a conditional use permit in the Santa Rosa Valley um, to continue um, essentially a, a wedding venue out there. So it has a lot of community interest, so I just wanted to, to prepare you for that day. So between our, our presentation um, of what uh, uh, Commissioner Westner has asked for and um, these two items, just to, to let you know, it, it might be, uh, it'll be till after lunch for sure. So that's all I have for you, unless you have something else for me. I do. Yes. This second agenda item today, you know, creates issues uh, and, and I know we, the, the problems associated with independent visits to sites and then right, rightfully or wrongfully raising bias or whatever else points to the problem that people perceive that we are acting unilaterally and if, if it's really, I would suggest that if it's really a high profile item, we may want to have a site visit in mass because I'm, I'm concerned that allegations against Nora or any of us acting independently uh, that an applicant doesn't have the opportunity to rebut particular testimony. People walk away thinking they haven't had their day in court, rightfully or wrongfully. So I don't know, I'm just talking out loud here. I hate to see people make claims like this. Um, and, you know, it's something you want to try to avoid. I don't know how you do it. I mean, obviously we have a right to view things. I guess when you get to something we know is going to be highly controversial, maybe it ought to, it ought to be a full commission visit to avoid these kinds of problems. I don't know. I have two words. Okay. Amundsen Ranch. Yes, ma'am. I Having wasn't, got I wasn't there, so I don't know. Well, I can tell you right now, I had to sit in that courtroom over there because I went and visited. And, um, and it was painful. It was expensive for the county. What, what and are you saying? I don't know. I wasn't oh, uh, the fact that well, I violated the Brown Act by visiting the property. Okay. And uh, there were extensive issues, particularly relating to the biological aspects of the property. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Sometimes you speak very quickly. The assertion was that the Planning Commission violated the Brown Act. And if you uh, would but allow you me to continue, it, Madam not, Commissioner, I not. would, just getting to that point, if okay. you would allow me to continue. Okay, I just... You jumped too quick. I'm, and when that visit occurred, two of us went. Because at that time, less than a voting majority could visit. It was deemed by the uh, opposition that it was a violation of the Brown Act and the serial conditions. All right, and so therefore they brought it forward. And so therefore it was brought forward and it caused a lot of consternation, a lot of expense of when less than the full body appeared because of the issue under the serial aspect. So therefore, um, after that county council had requested that we don't investigate the properties. On top of that, I wanna add to me, that goes a, truly against the why a planning commission exists. We have the tribal knowledge. We live in these communities. We deal with the people. We understand the long-term impacts of things that may or may not happen that we decide on. And so therefore, us not to be able to, uh, I made the 
comment the other day driving through Santa Cruz. I drove through, but I didn't look. Well, that's absurd. I mean, I've lived in this community for over 30 years. So, um, so I agree. The issue is now, where do we go? My, I guess county council, I would say, maybe we need a little workshop on what are disclosures, what should we be looking out for, so the perception to the public doesn't go out there. Well, the perception out there obviously was that Nora was testifying within facts, within her known knowledge, that they couldn't rebut or weren't prepared to rebut, I guess is a fair assumption, fair characterization. And I don't know what we do about that. I mean, the only thing I could come up with, and I thought about it since, is that if we know we're going to be in hot water, we better all go okay. and, and so, notice it. Okay. Just um, which ones are you talking about? The Which of her uh, allegations are you talking about? Well, when you say things like you can see things from somewhere or do things like that, that's testimony. Okay, and that affects all of us. But what I'm saying is, if she'd have been out there and questions had been raised, we could have all seen and whatever, and then there wouldn't have been any of those issues. She, she submitted the... I don't want to it's be like this. It's perception, Nora. It's perception. I don't know. Okay. Um, I think it has to do with... Uh, perception on whether or not you agree with the decision that was made or you disagree with no. the decision that was made. No, I'm talking just about their perception of due process. I'm on the other side of issues all the time. That doesn't bother me. Everybody has a right to their own position. That didn't bother me. What bothered me is she raised this issue that created all this whatever. And, and it I hate to have people walk away or other people or people in the audience or the newspapers think that somehow... People aren't getting their day in court. That's all. Okay. Well, it's it's really tough when things are alleged that are absolutely untrue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely untrue. Well, I'm not talking. Yeah, I understand what you're saying about representations, about conflict of interest, and your husband, etc. I get that, but uh, you know, it's, you've got to wear a flak suit sometimes. God knows. Sometimes you're going to get hit. Yeah. You know, I. Uh, uh, Nora certainly was familiar with that, had some familiarity with that general area from, from her prior visits or, or camping or hiking, whatever it might be. And I, like I said, I, I, uh, I'd been up in that area and I'd driven the, that road, but you know, that was so long ago, but it was, it was what it was. It weren't the houses that were there, but the roads were, were, I mean, well, less than what they are now, certainly. Um, and it's a difficult situation to get a grasp on if you've never been there. Uh, so I can understand uh, for someone who wanted, hadn't been there before, to want to, you know, put it in some perspective that they can understand, as opposed to work, working that kind of uh, decision in a vacuum. Um, I suppose you know, but from my memory, I, I might have also chosen to drive, just do a general drive. I mean, I drive up and down PCH. Uh, probably a couple times a month, so it wouldn't have been that big a deal uh, to do it. Uh, in fact, my wife suggested once, uh, well, between the two meetings, that we are coming back from L.A., you know, why don't you go up, why don't you go up and check it out? Deer Creek, I said, y you don't want to drive Deer Creek Road. <laughs> Certainly not in the, you know, late afternoon, early evening. And and so we chose, you know, chose not to do it. But uh, I think, I think, uh, you know, If we're going, we always have the option uh, to ahead of time to make a request of, of planning to, or to discuss it before we get to that point, uh, and see if there's uh, a benefit to doing a group visit. Certainly, Sadako is one of those situations. Um, there was a lot there that we would never, I would never have seen, and I know the area. Um, I still appreciate the latitude uh, and freedom to be able to, to do a, a visit of some kind if I feel absolutely that I want to do that. Um, and I think, you know, as long as we, if somebody chooses to do that individually without, you know, uh, a writing companion or, or by another commissioner to tag along, um, I, I, I think we can still do that as long as we provide the disclosure uh, that, I'm, you know, we we made a visit. We, we, you know, we drove around the perimeter. Not necessarily we went into the site or talked to anybody, but 
And that's not what I'm, I'm saying. And that's, and that's another completely untrue allegation. Sure. I would, I would just offer that the, the uh, board just recently, within the last year, changed the land use regulations, the, the, the laws that you work under, saying, yes, you, you can uh, visit the sites individually yourself as long as you're disclosing them. So that has been changed and, and reworked in, into the plan, so that's completely um, legitimate. So, you know, we can have a, a workshop you know, coming up about, you know, things that maybe we should be careful of or, or things that might lead to public perception. So we can we can do that. And I see Jeff nodding his head over there. So we'll put that on your agenda just to have a, an item at that. Usually once a year we try to train on something. You know, we try to train on the Brown Act, a little bit of CEQA, a little bit about what staff's doing right now. So, you know, we'll begin working on an agenda like that and, and putting it on. The thing about site visits you know they they can be expensive and they're expensive for the applicant and so that's kind of what i what i try to to weigh as well so you know it was a recommendation for denial for me i drove the site uh, you know not shortly before the hearing just to to familiarize myself with that before the decision before i made the recommendation and so i you know i think that that's fair game being at the site that that's what's allowed and maybe that the tipping of the scale is is research and so maybe that's what uh, that we'll that zillow ask. listing was was in our packet mm -hmm. that you know no agreed so all of those allegations were absolutely false that that notion that there was some kind of bias something that they were not uh, aware of it was in our packet and, um, and I just want to make um, a, a statement here that um, I am very sensitive to perceptions of, of fairness. And if there were uh, more than just a single individual uh, with this uh, uh, perception that there was unfairness, that these um, uh, allegations were, you know, had some merit, uh, I, I would, you know, I'd pause and I'd, I'd self-examine. But all of these allegations were untrue, and they were made by a single, very uh, passionate individual. And I think that's important uh, to, uh, to keep in mind in this instance. And I thought with the Amundsen Ranch thing, I thought that, that it was not a Brown Act violation. Is that what the court found that it was? No, it, it was not. It, threw, they it threw the, was they, not. They threw the whole thing out. And that's out what court. I was jumping in to okay. point out, that it was not. Because you speak very quickly and you said, visiting Amundsen Ranch was a brown at violation, and it, that's what I heard. And, and that's it, why I jumped in, because I thought, no, no, it wasn't. It was alleged, it was but a, it was not. And the specifics that was alleged, and this is what county council, that they went specifically to the serial acts section of the Brown Act. But no, Judge Walsh threw the whole thing out within five minutes. Right. Right. And and uh, and what I, the reason why I brought that forward is because you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. And that's that's a an experience and a point of view, you know, from from being um, here for as long as I have, and certainly, you know, uh, my colleague to the left. Well, um. <laughs> I think a lot of that was Well, in, you, I mean, you kind of anticipate in a high-profile matter that people will come after you any sure, way they can. Sure, they will. Cause see, they and they're got, setting a stage. If they got that, her. Hit it. If they got her, then the vote was three to one. Well, this matter is going for the Board of Supervisors. Yeah. With, with this, these issues attached to it. I mean, you've got to be careful. Because I've been in a position before where I needed to be careful. Even if you're careful, sometimes stuff will flow down your way. And so, you know, a lot of these people make stuff up. I guess, but my Any point, way I guess to win. the higher the profile, the more we should yeah. anticipate problems and bend over backwards. Had I known the compatibility for issue would have been as important as it was to everybody, I would have chose to see the property too, but I didn't. And I, you know, I should County Council has something to say, Mr. Chair. County Council. Lunchtime. Yeah, I, and I, I'm glad that you're having this healthy discussion. Um, and, and I have a, a kind of a legal point to raise, and, and it's something that I've, I've noticed um, for a little while. And this is definitely not intended to, to criticize any of you. Um, it's just um, a word of advice about the disclosure.
process. Uh, the, my understanding of, the, of the, the purpose of the disclosure process is, is to ensure that due process requirements are met and it, it's for um, you all to disclose your knowledge of, of, of the land, so to speak, and substantive <coughs> issues regarding the, the matters before you as opposed to potential financial conflicts of interest you might have, you know, and that's under the, the Political Reform Act, and that's under a completely um, separate body of law. And, um, and so my advice to you during the disclosures would be to focus on the former, on, on your, your knowledge of, of the land and those types of issues. So, and the, the point of that is so you get that out in the open so everyone can discuss it during the hearing, and you're excellent about that, and that's how it should be. And um, sometimes I see the disclosures kind of include, encompass the latter. Oh, I have this, you know, I have this friend, or you know, I know somebody um, who you know worked for somebody, and and um, I t totally understand that the purpose of that is just to to put everything out there to be completely transparent, and that's commendable. But what what what, hap what could happen with that, and what what I've I've seen over this last hearing is. You know, these, these are really heated hearings, like you're all saying. And so when someone hears a, a, a kind of a vague disclosure in the, the conflict of interest realm, then their, their mind starts spinning, and they'll even imagine they heard something else. And then it just it, it can create issues that we have to deal with later. And so, um, again, I, I, would, I would advise you to, to focus on the, you know, the lay of the land disclosure. And if you think there's any possibility you might have a conflict of interest, that's something that you should um, be talking to me about before the hearing. And so I can, I can say yay or nay, um, because if it's nay and if you do have a conflict, then you, you can't be sitting up there. Um, but I think the in-between creates misunderstanding and can create issues later. Um, so that's, it's, while everyone's here, I, th I thought I'd just throw, throw that out there now. Good, healthy discussion. Anything else, Jim? We're adjourned until uh, June 19th. June 19th, my God, two months. <laughs>